you can make it real. And here we are with Mars Perseverance, 51 years later, getting ready to do the first ever Mars return mission. Eventually, we can bring those samples back to Earth and determine for the very first time, did life exist on Mars? In less than an hour, NASA's 300 million mile journey from America's shore to Jezero Crater on Mars will begin with the launch of this Atlas V rocket into space. And at the top of that rocket, with a beautiful sunrise and shrouded by that protective fairing, is the Perseverance rover headed to Mars, ready to ride a column of fire and smoke on its way to the red planet. What a beautiful morning here on the Space Coast. Welcome everyone. Behind us, the star of the show. This is a life-size mock-up of the Perseverance rover, which is just like the one we are launching to space. Hi everyone, I'm Daryl Nail. And I'm Mujigay Cooper. In the 50 minutes leading up to launch, we will show you how this mission will reach and search for ancient microscopic life on Mars and test new technologies critical to the ultimate goal future human missions to Mars. That's right, and we've got the rocket on the pad and it is ready to go. A beautiful day outside. We're L minus 47 minutes and counting until launch. And so far, the countdown to Mars is on track. We've got great weather, the rocket's looking good, and it puts us on track for a launch at 7.50 a.m. Eastern time, the beginning of a two hour window. In today's coverage, we will hear Grammy Award winner Gregory Porter We'll talk live with Derek Muller of the YouTube channel Veritasium, along with the aerospace engineers, scientists, and a NASA astronaut. Oh, it's going to cool be a great that? show. Yes. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and we have teams from coast to coast, folks, helping us count down to Mars. We will go live to the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center just a few mm -hmm. miles away from us. And we'll go live to California to, Jets, to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where the Mars 2020 mission team is standing by to communicate with Perseverance after it gets to space. And of course, we are here to tell you what the Perseverance mission is all about. It's an exciting day for all of us here. So we want to walk you through what you will see next during the countdown and the rocket launch. So let's send it over to Joshua Santora and Mick Wiltman, who are with the ULA and Launch Services program teams. Gentlemen. Hey, good morning, Daryl. I'm Joshua Santora, and I am here at Atlas Space Flight Operations Center, joined by Mick Waltman from NASA's Launch Services Program. Mick, you excited to go to Mars? I am excited to go to Mars this morning, Josh. This is a great day. Uh, the sunrise out there looks awesome on this rocket, and ready for a great launch today. Thanks for having me on the show. Man, happy to have you along, providing a ton of good context as we go through. Before we dive into the story of Perseverance, we want to give you a preview of what's ahead today in the countdown. Things really got going this morning just after midnight, actually, and Atlas V is just about ready to fly. In a few more minutes, we're going to get the final check of the weather, and that weather report you know, should be coming back really positive. It's been great um, all morning. We have the terminal count ahead after that. Uh, we will be proceeding through uh, the last few minutes of the countdown, and then the, the drama will be at its peak at launch when the clock strikes zero, the engines ignite, and the spacecraft and rocket take flight. After successfully passing through max Q just shy of two minutes into flight, the solid rocket boosters will be expended and will be jettisoned. Nearly two more minutes and the payload fairing, what you might call the nose cone of the rocket that has been protecting Perseverance, will no longer be needed. It will split in two halves and fall away from the accelerating vehicle. One minute later, the Atlas booster will have finished its task of lifting Perseverance above Earth's atmosphere and being on the way to orbit. It too will separate, exposing the Centaur RL-10 upper stage engine that will almost immediately begin its first burn that lasts approximately seven minutes. After coasting for more than 30 minutes, the second burn, lasting around eight minutes, will take Perseverance out of Earth orbit and into solar orbit on its way to Mars. That sets up spacecraft separation and the final milestone we're hoping to hear this morning, the acquisition of signal. And I say hoping to intentionally because it's quite possible that Perseverance will be in perfect condition, but we won't make contact during the broadcast. So. Lots more to come, lots ahead, but Daryl, we're going to throw it back over to you now to tell us more about this amazing mission. All right, thank you, Joshua and Mick. We've got a lot of really smart people and talented people that we're going to be talking to today, but let's begin with uh, a scientist who's coming up in just a bit. I we'll want to talk a little bit about Mujiga Cooper, who's here. She is a planetary uh, protection lead for this mission. 
Uh, thank you so much. You've been working on this for a while, Mo. Yes, it's, this has been seven years in the making, and I'm so excited to share this moment with you and with those that are viewing today. I'm just ecstatic. It's fantastic, and we're in a launch period. People probably want to know, why are we launching today? Why are we launching right now? Um, we're in a period that only comes around once every two years. Yeah. Explain that. The orbits of Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun so that we can reach that destination with less fuel. So it's the best time. Short journey, less power. We like that. And we're studying the climate, the geology, and searching for ancient life. But, Lou, what kind of life are we talking about here? Well, when we search, we're not going to find dinosaur fossils, right? We're likely, no. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, <Okay. laughs> likely we're going to find it in the form of microscopic life. We're hoping Ancient too. life. We're hoping. hoping. Yeah, hoping. We don't know if it's there, right? Yeah, don't know. Okay, well, that's why we're going. Yes. All right, thank you very much, Moo. And back here on Earth, our friends at Twitter are celebrating Mars 2020 in a very special way we want to let you know about. Check this out. If you type, if you tap the like icon on any tweet containing the hashtag Countdown to Mars, you'll see an animation brighten up your screen. You can check it out. Also, the like button itself has a special little animation that you can see. Mm -hmm. Oh, right there in the corner, see that? Did you see that movie, the little yeah. sun and the rocket went You just hit it, hit it there. That's right, you just there hit you it and it goes. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> it will also work in any language from our partner countries, including Spanish, French, Norwegian, and Italian. Wow, that is pretty incredible. That's pretty neat. Yeah. And despite the daunting challenges, NASA has a long history of missions to Mars, going all the way back to 1965 with the Mariner 4 spacecraft. Yeah, we've covered a lot of ground on Mars since then. So let's head out to California and join JPL's Raquel Villanueva. Raquel, what can you share about our history of exploring Mars? Well, Daryl, in the past, we explored the red planet with orbiters and landers, but it was the ability to move around Mars with rovers that truly helped unlock its secrets. Today, I'm joined by Perseverance Deputy Project Manager Jennifer Trosper. She has worked on every single Mars rover mission for the past three decades. Now, Jennifer, how does today's launch fit into the history of exploring Mars? Well, we have always been interested in Mars because it's the thing that's most like Earth that we know of. And it's a little bit different today, and so understanding what happened to Mars will help us understand more about our solar system and also more about Earth. Now, as, as we said, Mars exploration started in 1965 with the Mariner spacecraft flying by Mars. And in 1975, we actually landed the Viking 1 lander on the surface of Mars. And then after that, we started sending orbiters with more sophisticated instruments. Those instruments would do global mapping. They'd find the minerals. They'd find the topography of Mars. They'd actually study the weather of Mars. But we found out that those orbiters needed partners. They needed partners to go down to the surface of Mars and explore like a geologist on Earth would, where he walks around and takes pictures, and maybe she takes some measurements. That's what these rovers needed to do, and that's really what started the Mars rover program for us. Our very first rover we sent in 1997, it was a Sojourner rover. Sojourner weighed about 25 pounds and drove all of about 400 feet. But she really showed us what value a rover on Mars could have. And so then the Mars program started the follow the water theme to try to understand Mars better. And the first two rovers that were sent to Mars to follow the rover were spirit and opportunity. They landed on opposite sides of Mars in 2004, and they drove 30 miles combined. And they both found evidence that there had been water on Mars in the past. But we still weren't sure whether that water fostered an environment that was good for life. And so then we sent Curiosity in 2012. The Curiosity rover was big, it had a big robotic arm, it had a drill, it had a science lab in the front. And Curiosity was trying to understand the habitability of Mars. Could Mars have ever fostered life? Could life have ever grown on Mars? And within months of Curiosity landing on the surface, she actually found an ancient habitable environment on Mars. But we still don't know if life ever did form on Mars, and that's the goal of the Perseverance mission. Wow. Thanks, Jennifer. And now that we understand how each rover mission helped shape the other, let's get to know Perseverance. 
know, Mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life. The Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes, but not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity, but we've added to it a whole new set of science instruments. And these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're going to be taking uh, microphones with us for the first time. We're going to have uh, that human sense on another planet. Perseverance carries with her a grand experiment in space-faring technology, a helicopter, the name of which is now Ingenuity. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're going to seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 2031. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration on Mars. And a great breakdown of the rover there. Welcome back to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where our next Mars rover will be propelled into space by an Atlas V rocket. And the man who leads the company, tasked with safely getting Perseverance off this planet, is Tori Bruno. He is the CEO and president of United Launch Alliance. We appreciate you being here, Tori, this morning. Oh, happy to be here. How are the launch team? How is the launch team doing? How are you doing? Well, the launch team is doing great. They've been on station for hours. They're calm. They're confident. They're going through the script. I'm a little nervous, but I always get nervous before all of my 400 launches so far. Wow. Do you get a little nervous? Why do you get nervous? Well, you know, a rocket is such an incredibly powerful and complex machine. Everything has to go right. Nothing can go wrong. And... It's just that it never gets old. It's always the same. It's always exciting. Yes. And this is a particularly exciting mission. Talk a little bit about that. This is the largest and heaviest rover that mm -hmm. uh, we've ever sent to the Red Planet. So how did you configure your rocket to do this launch effectively? Yeah, this is our second most powerful Atlas, the 541. We call it the Dominator. It's got four giant SRBs, each putting out 350,000 pounds of thrust to augment the center core. And so it has got the power to get out there to Mars, as well as the precision. It's the most accurate rocket in the world, because when we let it go, it's got about 200 million miles to travel on that transfer orbit. And precision is key. That is right, yes. So the power source for the Mars rover is a contained radioactive battery. I've seen it up close, and we had to alter the way we behaved around that. Yes. How has that changed your team's efforts? Oh, yes, the operations around that are completely different. Now, we have a lot of experience with these. We've flown all of America's RTGs, and we're the only provider that is certified to handle them. But, you know, it is still 11 pounds of plutonium, as you saw. Yeah. And in this particular case, the one very special thing was to install it in the VIF, where we would normally never breach the containment around the spacecraft, because it has to be clean and biological free. Right. But we created a portable clean room and brought this nuclear battery out and installed it in the machine while keeping everything perfect. 
Awesome. Can you explain what the VIF is actually before yeah, I let yeah, that go? Yeah, the VIF is the <laughs> vertical integration facility. Mm -hmm. So these rockets are so gigantic. Yeah. We build them in a factory, but we can't assemble them there. Yeah. Atlas and Perseverance are standing 20 stories proud right now in the pad. So they come to here on, they come to Canaveral in pieces on our rocket ship, and then we assemble them in the vertical integration facility. And the, normally the last thing would be to bring an encapsulated, under the fairing, perfectly clean and prepared spacecraft and put it on top, which we did, but then we opened it to install the MMRTG battery. Yes. Now that came later in the process, and that was intentional. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you mentioned there's a certification. for the, Who certifies the rocket? So NASA certifies the rocket, and then NASA and the Department of Energy certify a provider like us to handle a nuclear payload because of all these special requirements. Very good. You know, when you were preparing for this mission, you couldn't have imagined, uh, you know, a year ago that you would have uh, a coronavirus pandemic oh, yes. uh, wreaking havoc on this state. Um, how did you uh, handle that and how did you overcome it? Yes, well, you know, the one big lesson learned here is you can't buy back time. Mm -hmm. So when this broke out, our response was early, it was aggressive, mm -hmm. and fortunately it was effective. So we did all the things you might be familiar with. You know, we wipe down every surface every hour. We deep clean every evening. We are wearing PPE. We have our teams spread out. We actually change the flow of the work to keep our people safe, but to also keep these vitally important missions going. And of course, I can't say enough about our team. They're so disciplined and so courageous to persevere mm -hmm. through all of this and now to make our third launch under all of these mitigations, uh, I'm just so proud of them. Well, Tori Bruno, CEO of United Launch Alliance, we appreciate you being here, sharing your knowledge with us. Good luck with the rocket launch today and enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank go Atlas, you. go Perseverance. All right. <laughs> the countdown to Mars is well underway. Let's go to our launch commentator team for an update on the pre-launch efforts and a weather forecast. Joshua? Hey, thanks, Moo. Operations this morning have been really pretty quiet. Uh, Mick, can you tell us what's transpired to get the rocket to the point that it is today, right at this moment? Yeah, actually, Josh, it's great to be have a quiet countdown this morning. That means really good things for us here in the, in the ASOC. But the teams did come on station today about midnight. They got on station, started configuring the launch vehicle, getting it ready for fueling as we've been listening to them fuel the first stage Atlas uh, with LOX and the second stage uh, Centaur upper stage with cryogenics. The team continues to do that. They've checked out the avionics, the electrical systems. They've also done a, a flight termination system check with the range. So all systems are looking nominal and the team is now currently in their T-minus four and holding and just assessing the telemetry and the launch vehicle as we get ready to lift off this morning. Yeah, and it is a programmed hold. Um, so this is part of the plan. This is not anything going wrong. Um, we do have a two hour window today, um, but everything is charging ahead towards that 7.50 a.m. Eastern liftoff time. We wanna introduce you to a few of the teams involved this morning. We wanna start with uh, the U.S. Space Force. Um, they're responsible for the range operations and weather activities. Um, so Mick, tell me about the range really fast before we get this weather briefing in just a few seconds. Yes, yeah, so the United States Space Force is responsible for public and personnel safety here at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Kennedy Space Center where we're launching from. So a very important part of the mission today. They are one of five teams that are working with us uh, to launch Mars Perseverance on its way this morning. And uh, an important part of that, not only public safety, but is they also do weather for us to make sure that everything looks good. As we saw that sunrise this morning come up Don't right behind, everything Let's is looking good. Here, so. RC, LC. R.C. Conduct weather briefing on Channel 8 Weather Conference. Roger. Sorry, uh, we thought we were going to get that for you live, and apparently the audio is on another channel. Forgive us. Um, we, we should be looking at a visible satellite image. We have now mostly clear skies, a few clouds off to the east over the water. We were monitoring one cell on the radar 10 miles to our southeast, which has dissipated, so things are looking great for launch. We are go on all LCCs and expected to remain go through the count. Our temperature is currently 80 degrees could climb to 82 by the end of the window. Winds are currently from 220, eight knots sustained with peaks to 10 knots, 10% 10 POV for the cumulus cloud rule. 
Proton flux is at normal background levels and expected to remain so through the count. And this concludes the weather brief unless there are any questions. All right, so I think we're in good shape. Uh, we heard a great report there. Uh, again, hearing the go on all LCCs launch uh, Absolutely. La LCC. Launch my, commit, my, my, right. launch launch commit, commit criteria. criteria. I can never remember the second C. <laughs> I appreciate that. So uh, tell us about the T clock, because obviously we mentioned we're at T minus four minutes and holding. So we have a difference here in these two clocks today. Yeah, so the teams actually are working to two different clocks. The L clock, or what we call the launch time, or L minus time, is the real time clock, which continues to count down towards liftoff. T time, that's the clock that the team uses for operational sequences of events in the procedure. This time has built-in holds in it, one of which we're in right now, 30-minute hold, which allows the team to adjust things that they need to do throughout the uh, countdown tonight. So the L clock will continue counting down. And what's unique about this is at L minus 4 or T minus 4 as we pick up the count, these two clocks will sync up and we will count down to lift off this morning. One of the things we want to kind of piggyback off of the weather briefing for is to talk about the power source for Perseverance. Pa uh, Perseverance actually has a nuclear battery, um, which uh, that might be a little bit alarming for people to hear that. Um, it's not a nuclear reactor. It's a nuclear battery. Uh, and it's actually something that has been developed by the Department of Energy for this kind of a purpose. It's a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is a mouthful. Uh, but it's an MMRTG. It's roughly the size of a five-gallon bucket, um, and it is designed to actually make – how does this actually produce power for the robot? So it's using uh, uh, nuclear material inside, right, to generate uh, the electricity that's there. Starting off the mission today, it'll be about 110 watts of power that provides the spacecraft as we lift off. And it'll provide power for Mars Perseverance uh, throughout its whole mission life. So that's the unique thing about this battery source that's, that's pretty neat is uh, that uh, it will continue for the whole time. Yeah. The Atlas V has a perfect launch rec record, um, so it's in good shape. Um, so we're not expecting any problems, but if there were a contingency today, we'd want you to stay with us to talk through some of the details, and we'd be providing advisories. We have teams that have been focused on this specifically, and they're working towards making sure that everybody is safe and, and our robotic explorers are safe as well. So uh, that's going to do it for now. A, a great weather briefing. We'll send it back over to you to Daryl and Moo. Thanks, Joshua. With the countdown to Mars well underway, we want to take a moment to honor our country with the singing of America the Beautiful. We are proud to present to you now two-time Grammy Award-winning singer Gregory Porter. Glory Glaze, come on down. Good morning. For spacious skies for amber waves of rain For purple mountain majesty Above the fruited plain The beautiful baritone voice of Grammy Award-winning singer Gregory Porter. That was 
outstanding. It was so emotional. Oh, if really I great. could ro launch the rocket right now after that, see some rockets, red, <laughs> red glare, it's <that's> perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Porter. We appreciate that. So, Perseverance will seek to unlock many mysteries about mm -hmm. Mars, but remote scientific instruments can only go so far. Joining us now to talk about returning Mars samples back to Earth is Dr. Lori Glaze, Director of NASA's Planetary Science Division. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Happy yeah. to be here. Yeah. First, can you talk to us about the value of studying Mars samples here on Earth? You bet. So one of the most exciting parts of this mission, of course, is that we're going to drill samples that we're going to go back to Mars and pick up and yeah. bring back to Earth. And part of the reason for that is, or the main reason is, that we can only go so far with the instruments that we have on the rover. They're wonderful, it's a great suite, but nothing compared to the state-of-the-art instruments in the laboratories around the world. So we really want to get those precious samples back here so that we can do that really in-depth analysis of the samples here. In addition to that, not only do we want to study them now, today, with those state-of-the-art instruments and facilities, we can preserve actually most of the sample for decades and that will allow us to use uh, future instruments that haven't even been invented yet or you know, answer questions we haven't even thought of yet. So that's, it's really important to get those samples back here. And awesome. could we confirm life if it, if it is there with the instruments we have on the rover or would that ha actually, actually happen back on Earth? I fully expect we won't be able to make that real determination until they're back here on Earth. We expect with the instruments we have on board to be able to detect biosignatures and the types of things that say, yes, this is a sample that may contain evidence of past life in the sample, mm -hmm. but I think it'll be very difficult to confirm that until we actually get the samples back here on Earth. Speaking of getting them back here to Earth, <laughs> the, the key part of this, how will you do that? That's a great question. <laughs> We're already starting work on that next mission called Mars Sample Return. We think it's going to launch. We're planning for a launch in 2026. This is a really complex mission. It's going to require two launches from Earth and one launch from Mars in order to get those samples back here. Wow. We're working really closely with the European Space Agency, our core partners on this mission. So we'll have a launch from the U.S., which will launch a sample return lander that will land on the surface carrying a fetch rover that will go out and pick up the samples, bring them back, load them into a rocket, the Mars Ascent Vehicle, and launch them into orbit around Mars. At the same time, when we launched from Earth, the Europeans are also launching an orbiter from Earth that will be in orbit around wow. Mars, and it will capture those samples with that orbiter. We're gonna capture them, and then it will make its return trip back to Earth, release them, and they'll come down and land in the Utah desert where we will then safely carry them and put them in the curation facility. Wow, what a process. Awesome, yeah. that is so amazing. Thank you so much, Lori, for joining us today. We appreciate My your time. Pleasure. Enjoy the launch, get a I'm view. Gonna, yeah, go <laughs> Perseverance, go Ingenuity. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. Well, in the early 1900s, the Wright brothers proved powered flight was possible on Earth. Now, NASA plans to test a powered flight on Mars with an ingenious helicopter. So, let's get back out to California now and Raquel. The Martian atmosphere is 99% less dense than here on Earth, so this is no easy task to fly on Mars. It is, Daryl. Now, hitching a ride on the Perseverance rover is an exciting technology demonstration, the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. Now, if successful, it would mark the first time humans have taken powered flight on another planet. Ingenuity's project manager, Mimi Ung, joins us now to talk about the set of milestones Ingenuity needs to hit in order to take flight on Mars. Hi, by the way, we just had an earthquake in this room. But anyway, with that, um, Mars helicopter tech demo is motivated by the potential of adding the aerial dimension to space exploration. In the future, a helicopter can serve as a scout for rovers and astronauts. A helicopter can get us to places of high scientific interest that cannot be reached today. It's not easy to build a rotorcraft for flight at Mars. The atmosphere there is very thin, about 1% compared to that at Earth. So a helicopter for Mars has to be very light and have a rotor system that can spin very fast. Behind me is the full-scale model of Mars helicopter ingenuity. It's very light, 1.8 kilograms, about four pounds. It's capable of flying through the thin atmosphere of Mars and is capable of surviving and operating autonomously. There is a set of milestones between now 
and Ingenuity's first flight. The very first one is when we turn on the helicopter and the base station to check their health. First time operating in true space environment. The next major milestone will be when Perseverance rover deploys Ingenuity helicopter to the surface. The deployment will also mark the first moment the helicopter starts to work on its own in a standalone manner. It will never return to the rover. And the first major stone, milestone then will be the helicopter surviving the first cold Martian night, about minus, degree, minus 90 degrees Celsius. And we have designed the helicopter to keep itself warm. So we've planned for up to five flights in the 30 Martian days that have been set aside for our flight experiments. The flight data we get from the helicopter will inform our team the health of the helicopter and performance of each flight. The data could also include a few color photos. First ever photos of Martian terrain taken from aerial vantage. That would be true icing on our cake. Cake Mimi, thank you. And you're right, we did have a little bit of a shakeup, but everything seems to be okay right here so far. And we look forward to Ingenuity's first flight. And with that, let's head back to KSC as we continue the countdown to Mars. All right, thank you, Raquel. When the name Perseverance was chosen for the rover, our country was in the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the name is also a fitting description of what NASA teams needed to get this rover to the pad on time. Joining us now is NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Thank you very much for being here, Jim. Uh, perseverance is meaning a lot, and that includes a recently a 3.9 earthquake that we have reports of in California. Yeah. We just saw our own Mimi Ung. She said things were rattling there. So we are persevering a lot. <laughs> good thing we're not launching from Vandenberg today. Hey, you're absolutely <laughs> right about that. Things looking good here in Florida. I want to ask you, why did we choose, why did you choose to move NASA forward on this launch in the midst of a global pandemic? Oh, well, there's a number of reasons, but I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, the public wants to see the United States of America and our international partners do stunning things. And we, we have a history of doing amazing things in the most challenging times. And this is this is no different. Um, so so look, here's the here's the other challenging thing with Mars in general. You know, we can only go to Mars once every 26 months when <laughs> when literally the planets are aligned. And um, and if we miss this launch window, you know, it would cost us half a billion dollars to store this vehicle oh, wow. for the next two years. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons to go forward. Some of it is you know financial. Uh, you know, the the NASA budget. Um, you know, and, and then the other the other big reason is Americans want to see us continue to do big things. I want to be really clear, though. Uh, we have made sure that all along this process, if somebody didn't feel comfortable working on this project, they had the option to not work on this project. Um, and, and, and I will tell you, we didn't find that very often, if at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, will, I will also say that our, our highest priority were, was, was the safety of our people. And we wanted them to know that if they come to work, they're going to be safer at work than they would be if they stayed at home. Um, and, and of course, the, 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 the personal protective equipment, the social distance, distancing, the changing of schedules in order to minimize people uh, working on the vehicle at one time, all of these things were put into place as protective measures. But it is true, um, the name Perseverance, which was given to this robot by Alex Mather, who's a seventh grader in Virginia, mm -hmm. um, this is all about perseverance. And going to Mars, as you said, Going to Mars is all about persevering in general. Doing it now is more persevering than ever before. Real quick, we're, we've got a launch, of course, counting down. How are you feeling? Uh, well, nervous as always. This is a, a lot of money at the top of a rocket. And of course, not just the money, but uh, the, the entire life's work of so many you know, thousands of people. So um, look, it's, uh, it's going to be a good day. We're knocking on wood. Uh, but it's but it's going to be a good day for NASA. Thank you very much for being here, Jim. Appreciate always. your leadership. Thank you. you bet. All right. Thank you so much. We are now at L minus 14 minutes and counting. Let's check back in with Joshua and Mick, get an update on preparations to launch the rocket. Joshua, there's an important poll by the Launch Services Program happening soon, right? Yes, absolutely. So the, the countdown is continuing. Um, obviously, a status report, we heard them talking about the earthquake, and everything is still good. Um, we're hearing that on the back end that things are proceeding well. No 
no major issues or hiccups because of that. Um, other, everything going well. The savvy viewers out there will notice the clocks in motion, two clocks actually. The countdown clock there behind Daryl and Moo is, is at four minus and holding, excuse me, at T minus four minutes and holding. Uh, but the clock on your screen now is the L clock and that is continuing to count down towards that 7.50 a.m. liftoff time. Yeah, that's exactly right, Josh. The, as we talked earlier, the L time is the real time clock that continues to count down to zero. At T minus four and counting, the two clocks, the T clock and the L clock will sync up as the team continues to work their operational sequence events and the procedure. So team is very focused this morning. Uh, as you already mentioned, the uh, earthquake that was brought up, the team has assessed that and looked at it, and they're doing a great job and, and getting us to zero this morning. So we mentioned the U.S. Space Force as one of the five teams earlier. And next up, we have the NASA Launch Services Program team responsible for managing the launch. And we're going to hear a poll here from the NASA Launch Manager uh, himself, Omar Baez. He's going to pull his team for their readiness to be able to report out in just a few minutes. So he's very punctual, so this should be coming uh, right on time here in just a few seconds. Let's listen in now. This is the NLM on the NLM net. Uh, currently working, uh, no issues on the range or the launch vehicle. Weather is uh, green, 10% chance of uh, violation. And uh, winds aloft look good for the entire window. Um, the uh, spacecraft did uh, experience some earthquake activity at their uh, control center in Pasadena, but here's to be ready to proceed. And with that, I would like to pull the team for final launch pull and spacecraft can get configuration. NASA CE. NASA CE is go. SMA. SMA is go. SMD. SMD is go. NASA mission manager. NASA mission manager is go. LSP. LSP is go. Copy. NASA team is ready to proceed. All right, so we heard NASA team is ready to proceed. Um, he even mentioned the weather in there, which is great, only a 10% chance of violation. I, I, again, a big thank you to Jessica Williams of the U.S. Space Force, 45th Space Wing. Right. I like the fact that we're working no issues this morning <laughs> into this count. That's an important part that Omar brought up. And uh, the team, you know, one, one thing you need to understand about the NLM is it's a combined NASA team of spacecraft and engineering. So hearing all those goes is good this morning. Yep, and we're going to keep moving because we've got a lot to do still. We're going to throw it back out to you, Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Joshua. Our NASA teams across the country overcame challenges caused by the COVID-19 outbreak, as you've heard so far, to get this Mars rover to the launch pad on time. We are about to hear from workers at centers in California and Florida who took every imaginable precaution while managing to get this vital work done. When I saw the country shutting down, I thought for sure there is no way we're going to be able to continue this. It's something that nobody expected. It's something nobody could plan for. Rather than your first priority being mission success and, and getting to the launch pad, your first priority immediately gets displaced and it's now the safety of the people. I was seriously thinking Mars would be Mars 2022. It took a lot of work to put stuff together in order to keep momentum going, to keep people working safely, keep them healthy, and to keep the project uh, on schedule. There's no doubt that working in isolation, not virtual isolation, but in physical isolation from everyone else, is a challenge. It's hard for me. I have two young kids. Sometimes I, I'm not able to focus or listen probably as well as I would want to. A lot of our work was occurring in a clean room anyways, but that meant that even before we entered the clean room, we had to find ways of ensuring that uh, we were not putting ourselves or others at risk. Most of the time for these missions, our relation with the spacecraft customer is incredibly important. So usually we're able to be here working beside them on their equipment and making sure that all of their needs are covered even before they ask for it. It, it is a challenge, but we're used to meeting unique requirements here at the hangar and we pride ourselves in our flexibility. This is just another mission just with a different set of obstacles that we have to overcome. It might not be, you know, like a broken rocket, but it's... <laughs> It's got its own challenges. Our job is to go into the unknown. And this is just another example of the unknown. How to make this job happen when you're doing it largely through a computer screen. 
I asked the team a couple months ago if they would like to do something to kind of symbolize and mark these challenges that we faced. And they designed something that we called a COVID-19 perseverance plate that's now affixed to the port side of the rover. It has a globe representing all of us that face this challenge together, the spacecraft leaving uh, the Earth on its way to Mars, and all of this supported by the now familiar staff and servant of the medical community. And we hope that this mission, in some small way, can inspire them in return. Pretty much everybody that I've talked to that's associated with the mission has, has said the same thing, which is, you could not have come up with a better name than Perseverance. We have persevered through this. Nobody's given up. We won't get this mission done. We will get it done through the pandemic. I think it now is, it's a really important symbol of humanity, hopefully persevering through this great challenging time that we have right now. We appreciate that team as well as the medical community that really stepped up and helped. And it's ironic, you know, Moo, because the name Perseverance was chosen by a seventh grader who at the time he submitted that name. He didn't know that we would be faced with a global pandemic. So we are glad to have him and his family here, along with the student who named the helicopter, to watch the launch in person. Their names are Alexander Mather and Vanessa Rupani, and they are watching from the fifth floor balcony of our engineering building, just a stone's throw away from the countdown clock. Look at that. There they are. There they Looking are. cool. Uh, Alexander Mather, who goes to Lake Braddock Element Secondary School in Burke, Virginia, submitted the winning essay to name our rover Perseverance. Yeah, they've got a great view. I've seen it from up there. They've got the VAB in the background, as you can see there. So, so cool. it's such a beautiful setup for this awesome launch. And Vanessa, oh, you can see her. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hey guys, appreciate you. She's a junior at Tuscaloosa County High School in Northport, Alabama. She entered the contest as well and came up with the name Ingenuity for our helicopter that will accompany our rover to Mars. Thank you both for being here. What a neat view that is. Yes. All right, folks, with the coast phase coming up, we want to let you know that after the launch, it will be about an hour before Mars Perseverance separates from the second stage when that and when that happens, the rover will then be on its way to Mars. So hang in there. Yeah, don't go away as we will walk you through the flight around the Earth and we'll talk live with the astronaut Zena Cardman about our human exploration ambitions and NASA's Associate Administrator of Science, Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen. It's going to be great, folks. So stick around. It's L minus six minutes and 26 seconds now. And time to focus our attention on the launch operation the rest of the way to lift off. So let's send it back out to Mick Woltman and Joshua Santora. Gentlemen. Thank you. I want to let you listen into the to the remainder of this poll in motion. Let's go to that now. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. LD is go and you have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC verify T0 is set for 1150 Zulu. So 11.50 Verified. Zulu, that is 7.50 a.m. Eastern yes. time, uh, so that time is correct. As I'm uh, watching Josh do the yeah. calculations <laughs> on his finger there. Get my advocates out. No, right. no. So there's a lot to come ahead. Uh, one of the things coming up um, in just a, f a few oh, seconds. Minus five minutes, 30 seconds. Oh, oh NSC. NSC. Go, NSC. Spacecraft on internal power and timer set for T0 of 11.50 Zulu. Roger. OS, start list data capture. Roger. Fantastic. All steps are complete prior to terminal count. LC switch is ready. Awesome. So things are really starting to pick up here. You're going to hear yes. more and more chatter on those nets there. That call was to say that Perseverance is powered and ready to go, which is a phenomenal call. Yeah, yeah a couple things happened during that time, right, is a uh, launch conductor, ULA's launch conductor, Scott Barney, pulled the whole ULA team. They were all go. We got to the hear third the, of our five teams. The third of our five teams. We got to hear the end of that where the range was clear to proceed, and uh, ULA's launch director, Bill Collin, gave the authority to uh, go for launch this morning at 7.50 a.m., then we got to hear from the the JPL spacecraft team that they are the fourth on, team the fourth team that they are on internal power and uh, timers are set. Uh, they are targeting a liftoff of 7:50 a.m. this morning. So all things are looking good for us, Joshua. This morning, it's so you know we talk about being nervous and excited. This is right here where we're nervous and excited. Yes, uh, there are a lot of things happening as we get ready to count down uh, to uh, the liftoff this morning. We have about 15 seconds left in this hold before we pick up the count.
Yeah, we're going to listen into that. Uh, the fifth team, the one we haven't mentioned yet, is the Department of Energy, who is responsible mark, for the I MMRTG, the power source for Perseverance. Counting. Three, two, one, mark. Awesome. So this is now the terminal countdown. This is that time when things become more and more automated over the next couple of minutes, few minutes. And the, the energy is building, but the focus is increasing exponentially. Yeah, as Tori said during his interview, you know, the teams are very disciplined, very focused on what they're doing, the operational sequence of events that they're following. They are making sure everything happens, especially in this T minus four and counting period, because there's a lot of things they have to do. They have to finish uh, topping the vehicle, make sure that all the tanks, uh, first stage, second stage on Centaur are at at flight pressures and full of fuel ready to go for this morning. They have to make sure the FTS system is armed and uh, ready for personnel safety just in case uh, so that the range can do that. They have to check the uh, electrical and avionics systems. They have to make sure that the uh, flight computer has all the data, uh, information it needs to place Mars 2020 into the orbit it has to. So a lot of things going on. Exciting time for the team right now, but uh, again, staying focused and following that procedure they've got. Three minutes. As we look ahead to post liftoff, I want to kind of preview for you what's going to happen because there's going to be a lot going on. You're not going to hear much from us. You'll actually be hearing from the ULA flight commentator, Jesse Gonzalez. Uh, he'll be kind of giving those calls past liftoff that will walk us through maximum dynamic pressure and into SRB separation and then into fairing separation, booster separation, and then the first main engine ignition of the Centaur, Centaur yes. uh, RL-10. And so then you'll kind of hear us jump back in and help provide some more context to what's going on. Uh, we encourage you to stay with us for the rest of the show, though. There's a ton more content we have to bring you, and we are far from over. I want to emphasize that the countdown to Mars is not done at zero today. The countdown to Mars ends in February, when Mars 2020 safely delivers perseverance and ingenuity to the surface of the red planet. So we're going to let you listen in now and enjoy the last couple minutes of the, the process of launching a rocket. One minute fifty nine. Vehicle internal. One minute fifty five. Launch sequencer start. One minute fifty. Securing Centaur Leech two. Securing Centaur LO two. So there we heard the fueling is is One wrapping minute up. 40. In. Yep, fueling is wrapping launch up. Uh, the team is done. Launch enabled is done. Launch conductor sequence is ready to go. They're getting ready to turn the vehicle over to auto FCS sequence uh, at T minus 31 seconds. Um, so that's a big thing that they're getting done here. At uh, T minus 25 seconds, we will hear the team uh, give their final goes that everything is ready and One the launch 20. vehicle is uh, ready to lift OCU off and perform armed. this mission. SCS count started. One minute 15. Produce CSCS for launch. Roger. One minute 10. And valves locked. One minute. Rock report range status. Range green. That's good to hear, Joshua, right that there. Public safety there is accounted for, the FTS system. Uh, there you see on your screen a beautiful shot. Uh, the skies look great. There is little wind um, happening. You'd be able to see more of the, the venting. Um, if there were wind, the trail of that, of that venting. So uh, we're yeah. ready to go. And actually, that's an important seconds. point. The reason we don't see that Stable venting is the vent valves have been locked up to put flight pressure into the tanks. And as we just heard, they're stable at step three, which means the tanks are ready to go. And uh, here at about five seconds we will hear seconds. the team ECS reduce for launch give the final go 25 seconds status check go atlas go centaur go mars 2020 and there we go we are ready to go lift off this morning joshua eight seven six five five four engine ignition two one zero Lift off. As the countdown to Mars continues, the perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the Red Planet. And Atlas TU has gone to closed loop control. Coming up on 30 seconds into flight, the RD-180 is throttling down as expected. Engine response looks good. And Mach 1, Atlas 5 is now supersonic.
And passing 45 seconds into flight, vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. And passing one minute into flight, the RD-180 is throttling back up as expected. Engine response looks good. At this time in flight, the SRB chamber pressures remain nominal. The RD-180 pump speed and fuel injector pressures are responding well to demands on the engine. Standing by for SRB burnout shortly. And we have burnout on all four SRBs. Burnout pressure signatures look good. Standing by for SRB jettison shortly. And we have a good indication of SRB jettison of all four SRBs. And the vehicle has gone to closed loop guidance. Vehicle body rates are responding normally at this time. And coming up on two and a half minutes into flight, uh, the RD-180 has throttled down slightly as expected. Engine response continues to look good. At this time, the vehicle is uh, 50 miles in altitude, uh, 85 miles downrange, traveling at 6,000 miles per hour. And the Centaur Reaction Control System is now pressurizing to flight levels. And just past three minutes into flight, the RD-180 is now throttling to maintain a constant 2.5G acceleration limit for payload fairing jettison. Engine response and vehicle acceleration look good. And we have good indication of payload fairing jettison and Centaur forward, forward load reactor deck jettison. And the RD-180 is throttled back, is throttling back up to attain a 4.60 acceleration. Uh, engine response continues to look good. And Centaur has begun the boost phase chill down sequence to thermally condition the RL-10 for operation. Standing by for BECO shortly. Biko is the because the call for booster engine, and we have Biko booster engine cutoff standing by for stage separation. And we have good indication of Atlas Centaur separation. So there you're seeing live footage, and we have the Mach one. Uh, RL10 operating parameters look good. Uh, <clears throat> Chamber pressures are stable. This will be the first of two burns for today's mission. Uh, this first burn will pro be approximately seven minutes in length. So, Mick, that's pretty exceptional footage there. That's live video. Uh, we will see that switch over shortly into an animation that kind of helps let us know what's happening with the rocket, but right there, uh, a beautiful liftoff. Uh, fun to feel that rumble in the building here as we proceed towards uh, orbit and then towards uh, Mars destination. Yeah, absolutely. It was great uh, watching an on-time liftoff of the Atlas V with that little over 2 million uh, pounds of thrust. 
uh, cleared the tower in roughly five seconds. Uh, Josh, you and I worked the InSight mission, and if you recall, that mission on the West Coast took about 17 seconds to get past the tower. So with those four solids today, this thing really got out of here and on its way. And it's, uh, as we hear from Jesse, everything's looking nominal, and all uh, vehicle parameters are, are within the design limits, and, and we're getting ready to come up on a main engine start for that first burn that and Jesse was talking about. The, uh, yeah, so recapping this countdown to Mars, uh, the, uh, the stations uh, begin to be filled up this morning just after midnight. Uh, preparations, fuelings, powering up uh, all the way through that, that liftoff that happened. Uh, I think, Mick, uh, it wasn't precisely on time. I think you said it was like 10 milliseconds early. Um, so it's pretty much dead on. Yeah, dead on. This team does a great job. As I said, they're very focused, very disciplined, as, as Tori also said, courageous. Uh, they have done a lot of work to get us to this point today uh, through this pandemic, changed how they did some of their work. Uh, you know, made adjustments as needed, uh, a lot of cleaning, a lot of things, a lot of wearing their face masks, uh, doing all kinds of things. And so this is an exciting time, not only for the JPL team in Mars 2020, but everybody that's worked this mission and for the country and the agency. So this is exciting to see. We still have a long way to go, Joshua, yes. before spacecraft separation. Yeah, we had a really quiet countdown today, which is phenomenal uh, that we got off the ground on time. And we are proceeding now that we are in the middle of the first burn. Uh, it's tough to make out, but that engine is lit and it's fire. Um, so we are in motion. There you go. There's that animation we talked about. The telemetry there as we switch to a TDRS compatible data format. Uh, TDRS overall telemetry quality is uh, very good. The space tracking system. Um, so there you go. This is not an actual video, but this is an animation that's driven by real data. So although we're not actually seeing the engine on screen right now, uh, we can see that the engine is lit, and that is driven by the data that says that the engine is truly lit, and we're in this burn. Yeah, the launch vehicle continues to send telemetry to the launch team uh, via the TDRS network, uh, as you mentioned, uh, and that allows them to continue to watch what's going on and make sure all their sequence of events uh, meet their timeline. Uh, we continue on a nominal flight this morning. Um, this uh, this first burn, as we heard earlier, will be about six minutes. This will get us into that park orbit around Earth, allow us to get uh, on our way, and then get into that approximately 30-minute coast period that we're going to have. Eight minutes into flight, uh, beginning to see the Centaur PU system balance out uh, mass errors, um, seeing very stable body rates in the Centaur. Um, so we've mentioned five teams at play, and although if you were watching, hopefully you got a chance to see this in person, if not on camera, it's easy to kind of say, oh, it's over, like job done. But all five of these teams still very much engaged, still very much focused, because there's a lot of work ahead as we proceed through this first burn, and then a coast phase, like you mentioned, Mick, and then a second burn, and then spacecraft separation and the acquisition of signal from Mars 2020. Um, so a lot more coming up here. Mick, I know for launch services program, you guys manage the launch. Uh, so what does that mean? I mean, this is this is you guys' work in action right now. By the way, that's the fifth team that we didn't get to mention. We talked about JPL. We talked about DOE. We talked about United Space Force, uh, United States Space Force, and United Launch Alliance. Uh, LSP. We are we are like the brokers uh, to select this launch vehicle and help with manage this mission. So we we get our spacecraft customer, the JPL folks. They come to us. They have some certain requirements that they need for this mission. The launch services program made up of engineers and flight analysis folks and. They, they look at everything, they help define those uh, requirements, and then we go out and procure a vehicle from a commercial partner. In this case, it was the Atlas 541 for the Mars 20. Uh, 20 mission that was needed for performance, right? Uh, as as I, you and I have talked over the last several days, Josh, one of the things that was important for us to look at was that performance to be able to get Mars 2020 onto that transfer orbit into solar orbit to intercept Mars in um, seven months. It's kind of analogous to a football game, right, with a, a quarterback trying to throw a pass downfield. You need a quarterback with a lot of performance who can get that ball down there where it needs to be uh, and, and uh, so the receiver can ex intercept that, in our case, seven months later. There you go. Yeah, it's the longest football pass ever. Uh, the Earth is the quarterback. The Atlas is the quarterback's arm. Perseverance is the football, and Mars is the receiver. That's good. Uh, exactly right. And what we also talked about is that technically uh, you could launch to Mars at any time if you had a rocket that was powerful enough. But this is the launch period every 26 months or so, as we've talked about, that makes the most sense because you require the least amount of energy to get to Mars uh, because it takes a lot to get there. Obviously, like the Atlas 541 is 
is a workhorse. Yeah, as Tor- Tori said, it's their dominator. Right. There you go. <laughs> I, I love that name for the Atlas V, uh, 541. But we heard uh, Jim Bridenstine, our NASA administrator, tell us that if we didn't make this launch period, we would be down for roughly 26 yeah, it's, months. It's right? tough. So the period started July 17th and went to, and goes to August 15th. Today, July 30th, was one of those launch opportunities that we had. We had a two-hour window, and within that window, we had several opportunities. 25, actually. Yeah. 25 opportunities. And we launched at the beginning of the window on our first opportunity uh, to get Mars 2020 uh, going yeah. on its way. And and that, you know, that sounds like a, a lot, and it is. The flight analysis group, both at JPL, LSP, and ULA, did a lot of work to pick out those target sets and figure out where we needed to be. So they've done a great job, and we'll see how this mission continues. So, Mick, tell us about the two burns required here, and we're actually coming up on the end of the first one. Uh, ultimately, a lot of people probably, and myself included at some point, just like, why wouldn't you just keep firing the engines? Just fire all the way through and get to Mars in one shot. So the first burn gets us into that park orbit we talked about. We, we've lifted off. We've left Earth. We've got into a park orbit around Earth right now. And while we're in that uh, park orbit, we will perform some maneuvers to kind of roll uh, Mars Perseverance and the Centaur and uh, coast during that time, uh, basically setting itself up looking at the sun and away from the sun to control the thermal environments that uh, are on Mars 2020 during this coast period. That coast period will allow us to coast around uh, into the position that we need so that we can have that second firing to get the velocity needed to head off into Mars. Yes, and we will be back for that second burn in just under 30 minutes now. Uh, but for now, there's more to learn about this mission and all the amazing science that's involved. Daryl, back to you. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Great launch and great job, guys. Back outside now to recap. An Atlas V rocket carrying Mars Perseverance rover launched on time from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station at 7.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Incredible. After the rocket took flight, it separated from the first stage and was then boosted into orbit by the Centaur second stage. Perseverance is now preparing for a second burn that will put it on a trajectory toward Mars that's just incredible to say. It gives me goosebumps. It really is. And we're so excited about that as well. And while we wait for that second burn, hang in there with us because we got a lot of exciting coverage to go. We're going to welcome in our one of our launch guests, Dr. Derek Muller. He is the creator and host of the popular science education channel on YouTube called Veritasium. He also holds a doctorate in physics education, so he's really smart. And that's why you saw us kind of having some fun because Derek was here on set. <laughs> We're just having a good time talking about this launch, which I got to start off with that, Derek. Your first time seeing a launch in person, what'd you think? I mean, <laughs> what can you say? I have nothing to compare it to, but it was awesome, something I will never forget, and I definitely want to be invited back. So uh, <laughs> if you guys can make that happen, I mean, just so amazing. You did a great job explaining physics. Uh, what did it feel like? Kind of walk me through as you were watching and experiencing it. Well, <laughs> it, it's like all the physics goes out the window a little bit. It's a very visceral moment between you and this very powerful craft. I think it's just amazing all the, you know, the engineering that goes into making something that's that powerful and yet that controlled, you know, yeah. and to witness that is phenomenal. And then to feel the rumble of all that sound as it hits you, I found it a, an incredibly emotional experience. It's, it's almost unbelievable to, you know, see it taking off. It's, it's very surreal, that's for sure. Nice. What, what excites you the most about the Perseverance rover? Well, the Perseverance rover is going to do a lot of great science. So I'm excited, for example, that it's going to cache samples that we're going to bring back. You know, super excited that we're actually going to have samples from Mars in our hands. And I think that may clinch whether we can see that life is actually there. But I'm also super excited about uh, Ingenuity, about the helicopter, which I got to visit out at JPL before it was strapped to the underbelly of the rover. And to think about flying a rotorcraft in, uh, you know, another world essentially in a place that only has one one hundredth the earth's atmosphere it seems audacious and i am <laughs> impressed and amazed and I, I can't wait to see if it works you know i i am i'm cautiously optimistic i think the team is is phenomenal and you did a in fact a youtube story on it a piece on your channel and did a fantastic job going to jpl i did yeah and and i was just so lucky that it was like there you know, a meter or two away from me on the other side of a door in a clean room. And uh, that was, yeah, one of, one of the great moments neat. of my life. Yeah, That thing's going to Mars. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it weighs like about as much as my laptop. Yeah. And you think about 
you know, it, it's you know substantial in its size, and it's mm -hmm. going to go there and take off and fly all by itself because, of course, we can't control it mm -hmm. given the time delay and everything. I like that is I just think one of the pinnacles of, of human engineering. Yes, absolutely. Now this is going to do some big science as well. What are your thoughts on the search for ancient microbial life on another planet, Mars? Well, you know, I think chances are good that Mars once harbored life. It was so similar to Earth in the past. One can only expect, you know, life probably sprung up there as well. But I'm, I'm really excited to, for us to get that confirmation because I think it really transforms our ideas about life and, you know, how, how frequent it is. Right now, all we have is this sample size of one, one Earth mm -hmm. with life, you know? Mm -hmm. We find another one that's 100% more information and data, and I think it's likely that that life will not be exactly like ours. And, and I think it'll be fascinating everything we can learn about, you know, other potential forms of life just by finding, you know, life on another planet. You seem to suggest that you think there is life. I, I do. I mean, <laughs> you, you have liquid water for, I don't know how many, you know, half a billion or a billion years. On Earth, that was enough to create life. So, you know, the guess is that's not a unique thing, yeah. you know, right? I mean, I, the, the scientific hypothesis is you, you run that enough times, it's, it's bound to lead to life again in, in other circumstances. Dr. Derek Muller, we really appreciate you being here, YouTube creator with the channel Veritasium. You, we know you have a two and a half uh, week old child. Uh, <laughs> your wife is holding out. There's, there are very few things that I could leave for at this launch. That is one of them. Thank you so much for doing so. Get a selfie with our full-size rover back here. You see yes, that? Please. I definitely will. Very good. Thank you, Thank you so much. There has been a lot of anticipation by NASA teams leading up to this launch, but some won't be able to fully celebrate until the rover has safely landed on Mars seven months from now. Raquel, you are there with the Mars mission team at JPL in California. How are they reacting to seeing Mars 2020 take flight? Well, Moo, it's been quite an eventful morning with the earthquake, but you could feel the energy building in the room in the run-up to launch. And now I'm with Bobby Braun, the Director for Planetary Science at JPL. Bobby, now that we've started our journey to Mars, can you tell me how you are feeling? Wow, it's just, it's a great day. It's, uh, we're all so excited um, and to, to get started in this way and to be on our way uh, after all this work that the team has gone through. Uh, it's really, really just fantastic. That's great. Now, what's now that Perseverance is off the launch pad, what are its next steps? Yeah, well, we're almost on the path to Mars, if you will. The launch vehicle is, has done great so far. Our partners at ULA are just fantastic, and we're very happy to be working with them and for them to give us this boost so far. Uh, but we still have to uh, have another burn of our upper stage. We have to pass through the night side or the shadow of the Earth come out on the other side and, and find the sun and power up and then uh, establish contact with the spacecraft. And once we do, we'll truly be on our way to Mars. We'll have a, a, a spacecraft that's power safe that we can communicate with and our journey will really begin. We look forward to that. Thanks, Bobby. Now, Daryl, as Bobby mentioned, there's an excitement here in the room as the team looks ahead to the second Centaur burn. But before we get to that, let's learn more about the science on board this rover. All right, thanks Raquel. And as you mentioned, there are numerous scientific studies and technology demonstrations on Perseverance. Some of these are directly preparing us to one day send humans to Mars. One in particular is called MOXIE. Jeff Shihai from the Science and Technology Mission Directorate is joining us now to explain, and he is here with us. He, yeah, well, you know, you know, sometimes here at the difficulty with this technology. Oh, that's all right, Daryl. Well, that's all right. It's a Britney Spears style mic, you know. So <laughs> I'll hold it like this. I don't I'll know if you're uh, that'll work fine. We can hear you. Yeah. Thanks for making the adjustment there. So Jeff, this is an incredible piece of technology here. This Moxie, right? Mm -hmm. So tell us what is it and why is it important? Well, Moxie stands for Mars. Oxygen in-situ resource utilization experiment. That's kind of a mouthful, so we grab a few letters out of there and just call it MOXIE. And I, I think the name MOXIE has a certain kind of attitude that's appropriate for this <laughs> ambitious mission to Mars. But what in-situ resource utilization is, is utilizing the resources that we find at a destination to produce useful commodities. And so what MOXIE's gonna do is suck in the Mars atmosphere which is mostly carbon dioxide, and produce pure oxygen. Oxygen is a commodity that we can use in our exploration endeavors, and so um, 
Moxie is the first in situ resource utilization experiment uh, on another planet. How about that? So that's why wow. it's so important. If we can produce things we need at the destination, we don't have to load them in a launch vehicle, launch them from the surface to Earth, push them all the way to the destination, and land them on Mars or, or the moon. Yeah. Saving incredible weight, fuel, resources to exactly. use them, the ones that are there and in place. That's right, it took a lot of moxie. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the biggest challenges in developing this technology, designing it, developing, building it? Well, the, the team that produced the hardware that we just saw the, being launched on its way to Mars, they, they certainly had moxie because they had overcome a lot of challenges <laughs> along the way. When, when you start to develop new technologies, you're working in a laboratory and you've got all the room you need usually. You can build it big and heavy because you're not trying to make it look pretty, you're just trying to make it work. And you've got all the power you need and you can control the thermal environment and you can have people, teams of people come in and tinker with it and fix it when it breaks and all that. So, but and you can probably see where I'm going with this. <laughs> when, when you get to the point where it's time to fly that hardware to prove it out in the space environment or uh, on the planetary surface, then the rubber really hits the road in terms of the engineering. And that's where the teams of engineers come into play. And, and they develop clever solutions to implement the, the process that's been developed in the lab and package it for space flight. So Moxie faced a lot of challenges. You know what, once you, once you have to put it on the rover, um, the, the size becomes important. Mm -hmm. It has to fit in a certain yeah. volume on yeah. the rover. The uh, amount of weight or the mass becomes mm -hmm. really important. Every ounce you uh, launch into space takes propellant to, to move it. So yeah. uh, we want to make Moxie as light as possible. Had to fit within a certain mass budget or mm -hmm. they would have kicked it off the rover. Yeah. And we're glad you made it on the rover. <laughs> yes. And just real quick, and, and, and without getting too deep into the technical details, how does it convert carbon dioxide to oxygen? So Moxie uses a thermal and electrochemical process. There's a compressor that was built by a company called Air Squared. Some of that was funded under the NASA Small Business Innovative Research Program, actually. And uh, they built the compressor. What it does is acquire the, or the carbon dioxide from the Mars atmosphere and push it into the electrolysis system. A company called Ceramitech, a team led by a guy named Joe Hartvigson. Uh, they're now called Oxion mm -hmm. Energy, I think. But they, mm -hmm. they uh, built the guts of Moxie, which is the solid oxide electrolysis system that takes the carbon dioxide, CO2, actually pulls an atom of oxygen off the CO2, leaving CO. Oh, wow. And then those atoms migrate through the electrolysis system, and those oxygen ions are, are neutralized, and then they recombine, an O and an O becomes O2. Ah, and so we get yes. pure oxygen out of the system. That's fantastic. And so in order for you to get Moxie on board uh, the rover, actually you had to kind of clear through the very smart uh, lady to my left. <laughs> She's with Planetary Protection. So she actually had to clean off part of it. Right? Yeah, yeah. You had to heat it and then clean the, the That's ocean. right. Yeah, the socks part was actually self-sterilizing. It was hot enough so it cleaned itself. But there's a part, the O2 sensors, that needed vapor hydrogen peroxide sterilization. So it was the first time we used hydrogen peroxide on flight hardware. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So you can say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Very <laughs> Thanks much. for letting us do that. <laughs> well, you know, in speaking about uh, the rover, uh, Moo, what is it, you know, curiosity told us that we have at, or had at one time on Mars moving water. That's so, right. so what is Perseverance going to do in terms of uh, confirming whether life could have been there? Yeah, exactly. So the, the past mission set up the stage as far as understanding what could sustain life. And now we're actually looking for signatures of that life. And so some of the answers that you're looking for, which one are you personally looking <laughs> most forward to? Yeah, I, I'm personally looking forward to seeing non uh, uh, signs of life where no one will argue that it has a biotic source. Uh, it's very easy to say, oh, this chemistry could have happened from natural reasons, uh -huh. but I want to see a smoking gun. It would be awesome to see that. Now, that's not exactly easy, right? No, not at all. And so explain that, explain that to us. Yeah, so in order to get that definitive signal, one of the main things you have to do is make sure you have a clean instrument that you're sampling with. And so that's why we spent a lot of time cleaning, baking out hardware to such a high degree, 150 degrees Celsius for some of these parts to make sure it was clean enough. And so those parts have to be specially made to be able to handle that heat. That's right, yeah. In and order to get it past you. Yeah, all of the material selection, everything was done specifically for that purpose. 
Where else in the universe, Moo, do you think we should explore for life? Yeah, I'm really excited about Europa. Europa has uh, an ocean underneath the, a thick layer of ice. It has vents underneath that have a heat source. So there's a source of energy for possible life. Europa, a moon. Yes, a moon. Yeah, icy moons. That's the next place to go. It's interesting that you picked that. I mean, it's a very, very cold, cold place. Yeah. Um, you've got a rover in front of you that is I miniaturized. Do. We have one that is behind us. Yeah. Right. And, and as part of this, you also had to make sure that that nuclear battery was installed. Exactly. Yeah. There it is. yeah this this bit back here. Tell me about how that worked, and when you did it, and and how that process was. Yeah, it was only a few days before this launch day. I mean, we we just finished counting our samples just a couple of days ago. How about that? Uh, yeah, so we had to actually alter the way we sample. We take wipes and swabs of every surface of the rover. But for this, we had to make sure our head was far back and we had as minimal radiation uh, impact as possible. But we got it. It was super clean. INL did a great job. Everyone has done a fantastic job making sure this was as clean as possible. It's ready to go. What do you think about that full-size rover behind us? It's incredible. It's like, yeah. hey, you should be up there. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently it is It is right to scale as you take a shot yes. of it there. That's a beautiful rover. Well, it is. It is. thanks for describing all that to yeah. us. Well, we really appreciate the time to you uh, for you uh, describing that. All right, back into the show now we go. Moving forward, of course, this is the countdown as we go up. You can see the centaur there and the graphics as uh, we are tracking and continuing to track Mars 2020 on its way. And mm -hmm. when searching for the possibility of life on Mars, it's all about location, location, location. Mm -hmm. And Perseverance's destination is a place called Jezero Crater. Let's go back out to JPL now and Raquel, You've got a scientist there that believes Jezero Crater gives them the best chance of finding any evidence of past microscopic life. That's right, Daryl. Knowing where to look for signs of ancient life on Mars can be a daunting task. It took five years to select a perfect landing site. And with us now is Katie Stack Morgan, one of the project scientists who helped pick that location. Katie, can you tell us why we're heading to Jezero Crater? Thanks, Raquel. There are many reasons why scientists are so excited to send Perseverance to Jezero Crater and why we think that Jezero Crater is an ideal place to begin a Mars sample return campaign. At Jezero, we think that Perseverance can assemble a diverse set of samples that will help us resolve some of the most important questions about life beyond Earth and the evolution of planets over time. At Jezero, we, we know without a doubt that there was an ancient lake and river delta. And at Jezero, we have river valleys that flow into and out of the crater, and we know that that lake filled up with water and then overflowed. Water, life as we know it, requires water to survive and thrive, and we think that Jezero has all the building blocks uh, to support past life. At Jezero, we also have one of the best preserved deltas uh, on the surface of Mars. And deltas in lake settings are ideal for supporting life. And the rocks that Perseverance will explore can tell us more about the, the possibility for past life on Mars. Um, the rocks at Jezero Crater are also some of the oldest on Mars, between three and a half and four billion years old. And that's the same interval of time when life was developing here on Earth. So by exploring the rocks in Jezero with perseverance, uh, we have the opportunity to explore more about the development of life in the solar system and can answer some of the major questions we have about that fundamental question. Back to you, Raquel. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. And with that, let's head back to Kennedy Space Center. Daryl? Much, Raquel. We are back here at the Kennedy Space Center with our most special guest, Moo, <laughs> and the Perseverance rover. Here it is, a full sky, full scale mock up of the actual rover itself. Well, Moo, here it is. Yes. And so we've learned a lot about this rover so far. So tell me, kind of. Describe from top to bottom what we're working here. At the top, you've got yeah. the mass cam, which is pretty tall, it right? Is I mean, it's tall. towering over your head. It is yeah. on a stage, but yeah. <laughs> what does it do? Yeah, so it has some a lot of fun components. Some of them are the mass cam Z, Z stands for zoom. So you see those two stereo cameras. Uh -huh. And there's also that eyeball, what looks like an eye, is actually a laser. It shoots at the rocks. A laser. A laser, <laughs> lasers. Uh, and then depending on the signature that comes back, the spectrometer reads it and tells you what the geology is. And that's fantastic. Yeah. And some of the real exciting science, though, is happening right here oh. on this part. This is the articulating arm that comes mm -hmm. out 
right? And then goes down onto the planet and starts drilling. Exactly. What all is here that's going to help us understand more about the geology of Mars, the climate, and whether or not there was life? Yeah, there's, of course, Pixel and Sherlock, the really amazing instruments that are mm -hmm. going to tell us about the biosignatures. But in the middle, there is the coring drill. Um, the real drill will have a drill bit, a coring bit, which is hollow in the middle. And there's going to be a tube inside. This is just a 3D printed version. And as it's collecting samples, it's going to have samples that go directly into the tube. Oh, you've got a tube there. Yeah, yeah so there's a the 3D there. printed tube here. Yeah. And it's going to go down the middle of the tube as it's acquiring the sample. Once it's done, it's going to dock with the bit carousel here. It's going to ingest the entire bit with the tube inside in the sample. It's going to rotate down to the belly. And there's going to be a little arm on the inside called the shaw, the sample handling arm, to manipulate it, take pictures, uh, assess the volume, and then seal it. That's fantastic. And so there's quite a bit of robotics <laughs> happening between this part, the bit carousel, and getting it underneath. As yes. we know, it's now underneath. But here's a special guest, and we're going to yeah. duck down. This is the this is the Mars helicopter. Yes, ingenuity. And move. This thing is going to be actually tucked up on, underneath the rover. It was a late addition to this project, yes. but it's probably the neat, one of the neatest things on it. It is pretty amazing. 2400 RPM that these blades are going to spin That's in counter, fast. Uh, counter uh, directions. Yeah. It's a little bit under four pounds. It's super light. Uh, and yeah, it's going to, to be the first rotorcraft flight on the surface of Mars. It's spectacular. And and you know what's amazing? It will be taking pictures as well, right? That's Look right. The blades. Wow. These, these blades turn, Great right? Model. And they turn in opposite directions. They I do. Understand. They yeah. do. It will have a camera on it. It will mm -hmm. shoot live or shoot video. Yes. That we will then get back. It will shoot video of the rover as it's doing its work, right? Yeah, it's spectacular. And look at the clearance. I mean, it, this rover needs to clear this helicopter after it's deployed. All right. Well, thank you so much for giving us the tour yeah. of the mock-up. It's just like the real one, yep. except for it's not going to Mars. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And so by now you may have heard that this Perseverance rover was named by a seventh grader. And it was given that name, which is very special to us. And so we asked Hidden Figures actress Octavia Spencer to tell you why the Perseverance name is more than just a name to us here at NASA. We are a species of explorers, believers. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We are willing to do the hard things to overcome the many challenges. This is what brings out the best in us. We are go for a mission to the moon. Our path has led to success and to bitter losses. We come together today to mourn the loss of seven brave Americans. Yet, even when faced with tragedy and setbacks, we persevere. We keep striving. We keep believing. From space, we see our planet as a whole. We see the challenges facing it, and we face those challenges together. We will not give up. We challenge convention. We refuse to accept the status quo. The time at hand is hard, but we will persevere. We can still draw hope from the moon and the stars, from space. From exploration, there is a new day beyond the challenges we face now. Curiosity, insight, spirit, opportunity. If you think about it, all of these names of past Mars rovers are qualities we possess as humans. Ten, nine, we have ignition sequence start. But if rovers are to be the qualities of us as a race, we missed the most important thing. Three, two, perseverance. species of explorers. We will meet many obstacles on our way to Mars, but as humans, we'll not give up. We will always persevere. Our collective perseverance is what has gotten us to this day, and now Mars 2020 is on its seven-month journey to Mars with an anticipated landing date of perseverance on February 18, 2021. 
Now we are joined by Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen, Associate Administrator for Science at NASA. Dr. Z, thank you so much for coming over here. God, I'm so glad I'm here and I'm so relieved. You know, yeah. We have the space mission. It, 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 uh, we're in touch with the spacecraft, you yeah. know, and everything is nominal. We're waiting, of course, for the, for the, the second burn. But exactly. I'm not quite there, but we're really close. Yes. So can you tell us what makes going to Mars incredibly hard? So there's really two pieces that make it hard. The first one is what we're doing today, which is you really need to hit head in the right direction. Yeah. So take it off the Earth and have a lot of energy and head exactly in the right direction because what you want to make sure is in February when Mars comes, you want to be right there so you can get captured. The second one, which is the one that's going to make us nervous in February, is to entry, descend, and land. You know, so. So the Mars atmosphere is almost the worst of all worlds. If it was really thick, you could do what we're doing on Earth, which is go in and with parachutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there was none of them there, you could do you know, what we do at the moon. When in Mars, you have to do both on top of each other, which makes it 10 times harder yeah. than any of the other two. And so that's what makes it so hard. Wow. You've uh, devoted much of your life to science. And I know you were asked uh, the other day during a, a news conference, you know, uh, why another rover? And you gave a pretty impassioned response. Why is this rover important in your mind to the work uh, uh, that so many people are doing in science? So it's really kind of a key of a whole bunch of new research that we're doing that is focused on a question that for thousands of years philosophers have asked, scientists have asked, and we're ready to answer with the tools of science, which is the way to get reliable answers. And that is, is there life out there? We have, for 20 years, we've learned about the environment at Mars, and we're ready to ask that now. And, and the way we're doing it is with this rover. So it's really, for the first time in decades, the first astrobiology mission, we're ready for it. Where it's the next step, and and of course there's others coming. You know, uh, Dragonfly. Yeah. Uh, we're already thinking about, yeah. and you know, uh, other uh, missions. We want to, of course, go to Enceladus in Europa, you know, and really learn about life there also. Uh, so, so it's an amazing first in that respect. And whether there's life there or not, that that's going to be the answer that we're looking for in these places. So, um, we, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so. We want to do a social media question yeah, real quick, if that's a, all right with you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. We have a question from Twitter. What is the key difference between previous NASA missions, rover missions um, from to Mars, like Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, and Perseverance rover? In what way is Perseverance unique from the previous ones? So there's a fundamental difference in the approach. And the fundamental difference is that we decided to put the instruments mm -hmm on Perseverance, the best geology instruments on this. So we can find the right samples, and we decided not to put a chemistry lab on it. Mm -hmm. Guess why? We don't know which one yet. Mm. Ah, and so what point. we're doing is we're actually cre collecting the samples that we're going to bring to the best labs that are available to humanity, which are the labs all over the world. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's the choice here. And that's, of course, to do that, we need to do another first, which is humanity's first round trip to another planet. Yes. And that's what makes it different. We've got more with the launch operation to go, but real quick, how'd you feel about that launch? Oh, I loved it. It's like <laughs> punching a hole in the sky, right? Yeah. It's really getting off the cosmic shore, our Earth, into into wading out there into the, the cosmic ocean. I just I just love it every time it gets me. All right, awesome. very good. Dr. Thomas Zerbukin, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being here to explain all the science and the excitement that's coming up. Thank you thank so much. You. All appreciate right. it. Now we've talked to scientists and engineers and we have shared highlights of the mission and tech demonstrations that are central to the Perseverance rover. And folks, we have a lot more to share. Mars Perseverance has been flying in space for more than a half hour now. Let's check back in with Joshua and Mick to recap the flight so far and tell us what's coming up next. Hey, thanks, Moo. Yeah, as you're seeing on screen there, that is, again, the animation of the, the Centaur in motion around Earth, in orbit around Earth. Uh, and you can see there, like I mentioned, the animation being driven by real telemetry data. Um, Mick, how is how is the report coming back from the first burn and then currently our coast phase? So we're hearing from Jesse Gonzalez and the engineering team is that everything so far has been nominal. Uh, Centaur's been performing well. All the settling firings have been going great, which is keeping the fuel that's still in the tank where it needs to be as we get ready to come up on main engine start two for that second burn, which is very important to get us our velocity and into that transfer orbit to Mars. 
Yeah, so that will be up in just a few minutes. Uh, but I think we're going to actually send you back out to our main desk uh, to hear. Oh, so uh, sorry. I'm being held. Uh, we're going to hang out here. Uh, so so coming up, so talk about uh, C3, Mick. This is something that we talked about <laughs> having to do with the, the energy to leave Earth and, and go somewhere else. We're talking about having to get to speeds over 25,000 miles per hour. That's Earth's escape velocity. Yes, yeah, so the C3 is basically just the technical term that we use in the aerospace industry to refer to the velocity that we need to get uh, uh, the vehicle where it needs to be. So as you said, we got that little over 2 million pounds of thrust that we left Earth this morning with, with those mighty four solids on the Dominator. I still like that from Tori <laughs> Bruno. Tor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that one from Tori. But uh, we got off here and into the park orbit uh, with the proper velocity we needed. And then, of course, this second burn is so important for the velocity we need to get in transfer orbit. Awesome. So the Dominator punching a hole in the sky, <laughs> as Dr. Zerbukin said. Uh, so we will send it back out now to the main desk and be back with you in just a minute to catch that second burn. Daryl? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joshua. Joining us now to talk about how special these missions are is Dr. Michael Watkins. He's the director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, which planned Perseverance's mission to Mars. That is my home center. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Dr. Watkins. <laughs> so we have so many great questions for you. Why are missions to Mars unique? Well, you know, I think they're, they're unique for two ways. I and mean, one is just, it's just Mars, you know, it's, it's, it's been in our imagination for, for centuries. You know, we, we, it's a place that looks like the Earth. It looks like it could be home to us. It looked like it was once home to, you know, to, to what could have been life. And, and the fact that we can get there, and we can get there every couple of years, and we can send missions, and we can build on those missions. And, uh, you know, we, you can learn from your mistakes. You can learn from your successes. One of the things I, I, I like to joke about is, you know, we, we say perseverance looks like curiosity, but the people who built them are the same. They look even more like each other. And so they, uh, you know, so a lot, a lot of our folks worked on Mars Pathfinder, they worked on Spirit, Opportunity, um, they worked on Curiosity, and now Perseverance. And that, you know, that that history, that 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 group of folks, uh, they're just they're just world leaders, and uh, it's it's why we're successful. So you oversee the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, and, and doing incredibly complex work. Why are these robotic missions so hard? You know, they're hard because you, you you can't really see what's going on. You can't use your human responses, right? You know, you're used to driving your car and see what's happening, and you, and and, and uh, you know, you turn the wheel. In this case, you know, we've got to tell the rover, we've got to prepare the rover to do a lot of that stuff on its own, right? And so we've got to understand Mars, we've got to understand how the rover works, and we've got to put all that together into a machine that can function more or less without us. Mm -hmm. So we talk to it once a day, and we say, you know, how are you doing, and go over there and, and do these experiments, and then it's got to do that. So, you know, we kind of give it its intention, mm -hmm. but then it's got to do all those activities by itself, and uh, and that's a challenge. And the further away from the Earth you get, the harder it is. So you get out to Saturn, you get to Europa, you get beyond, and it becomes harder and harder. Yeah. Real quick, one question to wrap up. You've been in touch with uh, the folks out at JPL. On air, there was an earthquake that played, <laughs> played out. It was a 3.9 magnitude. How is everybody doing? How is your team? They're doing great. Uh, you know, our view is just it's just Pasadena. It's just the Earth being excited about going to Mars. <laughs> so it's a, it was a very minor earthquake. We have them a lot in California. Okay. Um, you know, maybe it's like hurricanes here or something. But yeah. uh, it's tropical storms here. But uh, it was a uh, it was a very uh, very minor event, and everything's fine. And uh, we were we are on our way to Mars. Okay. So a little rumble here in Florida. <laughs> some rumble <laughs> in California works out great. Mike Watkins, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us on the broadcast. My pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. We will have that conversation, a conversation with Zena Cardman coming up, yep, which I'm astronaut. super excited about. That's right. Yeah. Uh, on the other side of the Centaur burn and spacecraft separation, we'll also highlight six major technologies that NASA is focusing on over the next decade, including the critical energy needs for such missions. But with that, let's turn our attention to the next operational steps. Joshua, are you there? Yeah, Moo, yeah, we're here and we're excited. Uh, we have a fuel pre-start call just coming in. Um, we are getting ready to hear the call for this second burn of that Centaur RL-10 engine. Um, again, Mick, explain what this second burn is for. So as we talked earlier, the second burn is really to get us that velocity as we head into that transfer orbit, right? Centaur in Mars 2020 will head into that solar orbit uh, on its way with the proper velocity. We will then uh, get ready to uh, uh, separate Mars 2020 on its way. And I'm hearing that uh, settling is done and, and we have main engine, main start, engine start. 
There we go. Awesome. And again, that animation there being driven by uh, actual telemetry data coming from that rocket. So that's a, a phenomenal sign. Uh, and it, again, I think that it's it's tough with these images. Uh, perspective and scale are so important. Uh, this vehicle yeah. is in Earth orbit. It's not near anything, so you can't see the acceleration of what's happening right now. But for eight minutes, it's going to be picking up speed. Yeah, this is this is the burn that gets us really moving in the direction we need to go, that, that fast velocity that we need to get out of our park orbit and head, our, head on our way to uh, Mars. Of course, Centaur and Mars 2020 are still uh, and the together, system is in and uh, control we're hearing well. everything uh, is looking nominal on this fire so far. To, Main engine start was, was good, and the, the uh, firing is, is going well, nominal, there. as we see in the animation there. Fantastic. Uh, so this is rocket science, and it's not easy. We actually want to bring in now, we have a special guest. This is Denton, G Dr. Denton Gibson, Doctor. excuse me. Uh, yes. He is a rocket scientist. Uh, his official title is Senior, v Senior Vehicle Systems Engineer. Uh, Denton, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, did you enjoy that? Obviously, you got to kind of spectate. A lot of days, you guys uh, sitting on console, you, you have to kind of focus on your computer, but you got to see this one today. Oh, yes, it, and it was a beautiful launch today. Yeah, nice sunrise. Hey, tell us about your role with LSP. Uh, I was not um, making up things when I said you're a rocket scientist, but what exactly do you do? So as, as our role in LSP, as a vehicle system engineer, we are the engineering team lead for a lot of the rockets that we launch our science missions on. And we are responsible for the oversight and insight into these launch vehicles from for the NASA. That's awesome. And I know in the past you've supported a variety of vehicles. Tell us a little bit about the vehicles that you have supported and the ones uh, the ones you're focused on today. Yeah, so, so some of the vehicles I've supported in the past is the Delta II, which was a long-time workhorse for our science missions, as well as the Pegasus and Taurus slash Minotaur C. And right now I've been fo focused mainly on the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Yeah, awesome. Um, so obviously not focused on the Atlas V, but a lot of that experience and the process is the same. Mm -hmm. I want to take a moment to pause and say Denton's there at Hangar AE. That's the NASA Launch Services yeah. Program's Hangar. They're very proud of that. Uh, we call it the telemetry center of the universe. That's where the data for today is flowing. Um, but I wanted to also ask you, uh, is the process the same for all these vehicles? When we talk about the telemetry and these sort of uh, processes of getting from Earth to Mars, uh, does, does Falcon 9 experience translate to Atlas or are they completely separate? So uh, the overall process for many of these launch vehicles are the same, whereas as you, you ship stages to the launch site and assemble the launch vehicles by stages. So in that sense, they're the same, but there's a lot of differences between the launch vehicles that may change that process a little bit. But in general, the processes are the same. Yeah, and Joshua, I was going to say, uh, Denton, I work with Denton quite a bit over the years, and he, you know, he talks about the different vehicles he's worked on, um, but Denton is one of my senior vehicle engineers in LSP, and so although he's not totally supporting Atlas V today, he does have experience with Atlas V, and as, as he said, things are very similar. So using his experience, we're able to train and bring on new generation of engineers, and Denton's been a, a awesome. huge part of that to allow us to grow our uh, bench, if you will, to start working commercial partners. Yeah, awesome. So Denton, tell us a little bit about kind of what's involved, what goes in behind the scenes, what's the rocket science of going from Earth to Mars, this this maneuver to go uh, into solar orbit? Yeah, so a lot of the things that happen behind the scenes are, it's a lot of analysis work done by our analysis teams. I mean, it's months and months of analyses that are, that are performed based on the orbit insertion, um, the, the performance of the launch vehicle, a lot of modeling and simulations is done to be, be able to, to get to this point to where, where we can transfer from Earth orbit into solar orbit. Awesome. And obviously, you're a rocket scientist. Um, that's for a lot of people. That's like the pinnacle. That's like, hey, I want to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> uh, so where do you go from here in your career? Because obviously, like, I'm sure there's lots of things that you'd like to go and accomplish. So, you know, going from here, I mean, one of the coolest things uh, about this job of working in the launch services program is working the launch, right? I mean, who, who doesn't love the launch and who we, doesn't love, love working the launches? Yeah, we <laughs> love them. We love them. Excitement this morning, right, Denton? We, yeah. we got to see that's that's what it's all about. Of course. So, you know, one of, one of the ideal jobs would be a launch director because you get to work all the launches. I mean, Very how good. cool is that? No, yeah, that's true. And and I guess you get to, uh, on some, is it right to say you call the shots or is it that the buck stops with you or how would you say that? Uh, I'd, I'd say the buck <laughs> stops with the launch manager. Right? As, as today we talked, right, Omar Baez is our launch manager for March 2020 and, and he had to pull the team and make sure everything's ready to go. So the buck does stop with him right there uh, on today's launch. And, and as Denton says, I think there's a lot of people that would love that job and Denton's 
Denton's definitely looking at that next step. So I guess we need to give Omar and his assistant launch manager, Tim Dunn, a heads up. Yeah, there you go. That, uh, Dr. Gibson. Dr. Gibson is Up on the coming. way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, Dr. Gibson, before we let you go, give us a real quick snapshot. I know you have a mission coming up later this year. What are you working on? So um, so, so we're, we're, we're supporting the Crew-1 launch coming up, so we're helping commercial crew out with that one, as well as Sentinel-6 as far as the LSP missions um, that's coming up. Um, later on this year, and so we're excited about that one. Yeah, a ton going on. Dr. Gibson, appreciate you. Thanks. Uh, and I want to take a special moment on the commercial crew note uh, yeah, to I, comment. I, we've got a, a big day coming up. Yes. Um, pending weather, um, there's a tropical system that might kind of yeah. get in the mix here, um, but we have a tropical system that could create some problems. Otherwise, we've got Bob and Doug from Demo 2. They're coming home on August 2nd. Yes, I was going to say, Joshua, that's important for us also in LSP. Uh, Denton was my lead uh, VSC along with a, a few others uh, that are in the group that uh, worked that mission with the commercial crew program and so it's really important for us to be able to support other programs within the agency to to make these things happen as we as we launch mars 2020 today uh which is another step for us getting humans to mars right is uh getting humans launched off of earth soil was a huge step for um off of american, american soil, soil yes was uh was a huge step for us yeah and so talk about that really briefly with lsp obviously denton there uh, appreciate him and, and his contribution uh and you working towards commercial crew but also supporting Artemis, uh, which is a nut, which is also part of that path of getting humans to Mars someday. Artemis is about learning to live on the moon to sustain a presence there with the eyes on Mars. So how is LSP supporting even Artemis? Yeah, one of the things there is the gateway program, right? Deep Space Logistics that uh, is uh, working a lot of that. And so LSP is in the works of, of supporting gateway and helping them work with the commercial partners that are providing the rockets for those kind of missions that are out there and future things. One of the cool things about working with Launcher Services program is that we work with all of our commercial partners, SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, uh, Northrop Grumman Space Systems, and of course some up and comings. You may have heard a, some, right? It is like a growing Blue Origin. Field. Yeah, um, it's definitely a growing field in the aerospace industry, and and LSP takes pride in, in working with those commercial partners to figure out what we can do for NASA and the country. Awesome. Yeah, it is a it is an exciting time for spaceflight. The commercial spaceflight industry is booming. Uh, there's always new things happening. If you keep an eye on the news, you will see new things. Uh, we're getting word now that the the engine cutoff here should be happening momentarily. Once we see that happen, we'll have roughly, f I believe it's five minutes, until we actually see the spacecraft separation occur. So we're going to stay with you through that, uh, but want to kind of just preview that for you, that hopefully on screen here, you should be seeing that engine cut off, and that's completely expected. That's that's a nominal operation, no, as nominal you say, operation. We'll hear from Jesse Gonzalez, who's looking at the launch vehicle telemetry and, and watching the animation there. So uh, let's listen in for uh, Jesse here. And there's the call, and there's yep. the animation again, uh, modified based on the data. RL10 so shut down let's, parameters let's talk about good. communication for a minute, Nick, because seeing, it is not an automatic thing to so just seeing, shoot uh, information at Earth and actually, have that um, be usable. Uh, so how do we go about communicating not only through launch but on the way to Mars, and then once we're at Mars? Yeah, so the important thing this morning is when we lifted off from, from Complex 41 here at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, we had ground stations that were looking at the launch vehicle and tracked it all the way to provide, uh, provide data. Once we got onto orbit after a stage separation, you heard a call out for TDRS, uh, the telemetry network that, that NASA owns, uh, which, by the way, is also used for the ISS and will, yeah. be, will be used, uh, hopefully, for the landing with Doug and them. Yes. Um, so getting off the ground today was great because we could deconflict some of that TDRS usage, right? Um, but TDRS is very important for us to, to be able to get the telemetry from the launch vehicle back down to Earth here. And then, of course, when Mars 2020 separates and it gets on its way to Mars, then the JPL team will take advantage of NASA's deep space network, um, which has been around for a long time, to be able to transmit uh, commands and data back and forth uh, to the Mars 2020. So it takes a lot of folks to work those, and, and the TDRS and deep space network are very important to not only the science missions, but human space flight also. Yeah, and I think the coordination of that is something that people don't get a chance to understand much, because as you said, we're using TDRS for crew return, we use TDRS for space station, and TDRS is not an unlimited resource. We have a, a good number of teacher satellites in orbit that help us do these things, but it is a coordinated effort across the globe um, because we even have ground stations in Australia, I think. Yeah. Where are all of our ground stations even? We, we have ground stations 
everywhere, not only here in America on the West Coast and East Coast, but then you get into the uh, South Africa area. Uh, Australia, you said, we have uh, several ground stations that catch up different things uh, for missions. But, of course, in orbit, TDRS and the Deep Space Network are very important. And as you said, there's not an, there's not an unlimited amount of resources there in the TDRS Network. So we have to coordinate those things within the NASA agency and with our commercial partners when they're used uh, for our launches. And, again, that's another part of what uh, NASA does as, as an agency. Yeah, so um, just on that note, kind of thinking about around the world, currently uh, this spacecraft is roughly over the South Indian Ocean, uh, so that's just thinking about how fast we're moving, uh, just just the amazing world of space flight. It's just yeah. hard to put into words sometimes, yeah. of like we're, we're literally flying around the Earth and we're already halfway around it. Um, and so I want to talk actually about planetary protection some more. I know we heard about that a little bit from Moo, uh, about how they're working to protect Mars from contamination, so to speak, just putting things there we don't, we don't want. And we have to consider that, or ULA has to consider that, when they're flying to Mars and delivering the spacecraft. Yeah, it's a combined team. ULA, JPL, LSP had to look at that uh, for uh, when we get ready for spacecraft separation here in about a minute, right? One of the things we talked earlier is that Centaur and Mars 2020 are on the same path towards Mars right now. So once we separate, Centaur will do a CCAM maneuver, or what we call a contamination and control avoidance maneuver, and then blow down what's left of propellants in its tank. And by doing that, we have now put Centaur on a different track so that it will not intercept Mars or interfere with Mars 2020 at all for approximately the next 50 years. Yeah. Uh, and that, that took a lot of work by the JPL team and, and the launch team to make sure that would happen. So again, another planetary protection maneuver that, that had to be done. Yeah. And I understand from the telemetry experts in LSP that th this rocket actually, after the second burn, is not Low actually left. aimed One straight at Mars for that reason. It's actually aimed slightly off of Mars. And so Perseverance, Mars 2020, uh, will redirect itself just slightly. We're not talking about uh, over seven months, a little bit of difference here makes a lot of difference later. Absolutely. Um, and, and Josh, yeah. uh, we, we hear Jesse telling us that Centaur is uh, spinning up. Uh, this is the oh, maneuver great. right prior to uh, spacecraft separation where we get and into a slight roll to give uh, Mars 2020 uh, some, some Centaur tank pressure stability. Uh, very good performance from the RCS system um, and stable indications from the avionics systems as well. So RCS there, the reaction control system, that's those small, the, the, the series of those small engines that you see firing around the spacecraft, those are used for that in-flight um, operations that they need, the rolling op activities, as Mick's saying, is basically providing stability to the flight of Mars 2020 as we go forward. Tell us about, actually. And we have separate, successful separation of Mars 2020 with the Perseverance rover. There we go. Awesome. We got some nice applause there. That is a big moment. We are hoping to get some live video back from that um, because of the time delays with communicating with things in space. Uh, we don't have it at this instant. We're hoping we'll get to see that here in a few minutes, um, and we'll bring that to you if we do. Uh, but tell us about the separation maneuver because the, the apparatus, the, the actual – it's, it's a really simple it's a design. Separ it's a separation clamp. We'll talk about that in a minute, but it, as you see on your screen right now, you see the uh, Mission Director Center where Omar Baez and the team are. And Josh, you and I joked about this a little bit earlier, um, but with the, with the pandemic and everything going on, the teams have done a great job. The Normally, spacecraft separation. separation. With the Perseverance rover, the Centaur will now perform its standard propellant blowdown sequence to inert the vehicle and complete today's flight after completing its, uh, its CCAM avoidance maneuver. This will conclude today's commentary of the Mars 2020 mission. This is Atlas Flight Commentary signing off. So, so that's the end of ULA's job for yeah, today. Jesse, Jesse Gonzalez did a great job with yep. ULA commentary this morning. But what I was saying about the Mission Director Center is normally we would see a lot of clapping, a lot of hoop a lot of hand high shaking, fives, hand shaking. Fives, yeah. But with the pandemic and everything, people are staying their distance, taking the guidelines seriously, wearing masks, wearing masks with this. So we saw a lot of... Air high air, fives, air fives, right? Yes, and so, absolutely. So that does not take away from what the team is, how excited they are. Um, they have done a lot of work to get to this point, and that seeing spacecraft separation is is awesome. So, yeah. but, but well, getting, and, and and throw all of all on top of all that, 2020 was like here, have an earthquake, right? Uh, so it's just we did it. Like yes. what a, we're we're most of the way there, not not there yet. Yeah, as you heard Omar earlier in the broadcast say, uh, a lot of us uh, when we started this and when the pandemic started. We kind of thought Mars 2020 might be Mars 2022. Yeah. But uh, uh, Mr. Bridenstine and the NASA agency decided to move forward. The teams found ways to do this. Uh, as we heard, they were disciplined, they were focused, they were courageous. And uh, 
all that played off today with a successful launch at 750 and now spacecraft separation, Mars 2020, perseverance and ingenuity on their way to on the red planet. Hey, uh, we're going to wait for acquisition of signals. Stay with us. But really fast, Nick, tell us very, very quickly about this this mechanism because we, we oh, teased it. We teased uh, it, yeah. How the, do these things so, separate? So the separation uh, system is, is called a Mormon clamp band, actually designed um, earlier by Karl Marx, one of the Marx brothers. Very simple uh, design, but it, uh, it has uh, some spring systems in it that once the uh, signal is sent and the bolts release the uh, clamp band, the springs basically just give just enough force to push the spacecraft off the front of the vehicle. Awesome. And again, hopefully we'll see that video here momentarily. But for now, uh, we're going to send it back to you and check in uh, for one final time in a little bit with um, the folks here at, at ASOC. Uh, but Daryl, back to you. All right. Thank you. And great job, both of you, Joshua and Mick. It's always great to see Mick explain that springs are what's getting us to Mars. <laughs> All right. So we've got our second burn underway. We've been flying for right about an hour. And as you just saw, spacecraft separation went well. And so that's fantastic. We can now say that Perseverance is officially on its way to Mars. What a beautiful thought that is. And while NASA has been tracking the spacecraft since launch with its tracking and data relay satellite system, I know the mission control team at JPL is turning their attention to the next milestone. And that is ensuring that the array of communication antennas known as the Deep Space Network, or DSN, begin to receive a signal from the spacecraft flying the Perseverance rover to Mars. We expect to see the teams acquire the signal close to 914 Eastern time. Though, as you saw, the spacecraft separation has occurred in the shadow of the Earth and out of line of sight of the system. So this could take a bit longer than estimated. All right. And so finding life on Mars won't be as easy as you might think. And we talked a little bit about that. Here to talk about that and more is NASA astronaut Zena Cardman. Zena is here to join us, and we're so glad that you're here. Thanks for taking the time. First of all, your reaction to that launch. Wow. Every time it takes my breath away. I had actually never seen a launch before until I got this job as an astronaut, and wow. now I'm very lucky to have seen three. And every single time, it just makes me feel so much emotion. And kind of talk us through, I mean, it got up quick, right? So as you were watching it, you feel the rumble? The it did, yeah. First you see it go up, and then you feel the rumble as the sound travels to you, and you can really feel it in your chest. It's amazing. Very good, very good. Talking about astrobiology now, you're, um, you have an amazing uh, background. Uh, you've searched for signs of life in some of the most extreme environments on Earth, the Antarctic, the Arctic. Um, so you're used to looking for these biosignatures. What, you, what are your thoughts about this rover searching for signs of life? Yeah, you know, we have a lot of experience looking for signs of life in unusual environments here on Earth. So if you take a look at Mars today, it's very cold and very dry. And we have some places on Earth that are actually a lot like that. So places like Antarctica or deserts. But if you want to look for signs of ancient life, life that existed billions of years ago, perhaps, when Mars looked maybe a lot more like Earth does today, you have to know what those signs of life left behind in the rock record. Because microorganisms are very tiny and very soft, so they don't leave a fossil the same way a dinosaur would leave a bone or a footprint. So instead, we use these chemical signatures. Oh, Daryl's dreams is shattered again. We, we told him there's going to be no dinosaur bones on there. He really wanted them. I wanted to see something wiggling around, but uh, yeah, yeah, no. So why do we need to go to the moon before we go to Mars? That's such a good question because we've been to the moon, right? But we haven't been to the moon to stay. We really don't know how to live off of Earth on another planetary body. And we really need to figure out how to use resources, use tools, especially if we want to do geology on Mars. The tools that we use here on Earth are going to look pretty similar, but they might not work quite the same way. And because the round trip to Mars is so much longer than the round trip to the moon, when we go, we want to do it right. Very good. And uh, how do you like that rover behind you? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Hey, I want to ask you some social uh, questions now. These Absolutely. are some uh, from our audience who have been watching. Oh, so great. We appreciate you uh, doing that. Our first question comes to us through Facebook. Thomas asks, will Perseverance land to investigate the landing site for a future manned mission in the same location? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. I think one of the most interesting things about doing a mission to Mars is choosing where you're going to go. Yeah. Because, you know, you can imagine planning a 
mission from Mars to the Earth, and if something landed in Utah versus landed in the ocean, your your vision of Earth might be quite different. Mm -hmm. So one possible approach is taking a human mission and going back to somewhere where these rovers have been already, or maybe we'll decide to explore somewhere new. I have no idea yet, but <laughs> I can't wait to find out. Awesome. It looks like we have another social media question from Twitter from Huda. Do you think that in a few years we'll be able to send astronauts to Mars in a safe way if we are able to send a rover like Perseverance to Mars in a safe and amazingly planned way? I hope so. We <laughs> won't go until it's safe for humans for yeah. sure, and we're not going until it's a round trip. But actually part of this mission, of course, is a round trip, and so we will eventually learn how to send a rocket to Mars and then have something lift off of Mars and come back. Awesome. Well, Zena Cardman, thank you so much for being here. You did a fantastic job. You were a great guest, and uh, thank glad you, so you enjoyed much. the launch. Oh, yeah. my goodness. It's impossible not to. <laughs> no, no doubt. All right. Thank, thank you, you both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, there are a lot of systems to develop and prove out as we prepare for sending humans to Mars, as you just heard. Here now are six technology disciplines that are critical to the success of our future explorations. NASA's first Mars rover were powered by solar energy, but dust storms caused issues by blocking much needed sunlight. So NASA upgraded to nuclear batteries provided by the Department of Energy. And joining us now is the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy, Dr. Rita Barnwall. Thank you so much for being here. Great, thank you for having me. Great to all, be here. How did you enjoy the launch? It was amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. So, so fortunate to be able to be here and be invited to watch it. I, I'm i just giddy. <laughs> have you ever seen one before? No, I hadn't, it was my first one. And what did you feel as you were? It was, you could literally feel yeah. the, the, the launch. So it was, um, it was very exciting. Very good. Yeah. So it's really interesting. I, I, when I saw this segment, I was just fascinated by the whole nuclear part of this. This is right in your wheelhouse. So explain to me, how did the Department of Energy get into the, the business of making nuclear batteries for space exploration? So space exploration requires uh, power sources for uh, the long-lived missions that uh, we need for, for this type of activity, for heat and electricity uh, to be provided to the spacecraft and the scientific instruments. Mm. Um, and nuclear energy can certainly provide that power. Uh, one source is the radioisotope power system, uh, RPS. 
Uh, part of that RPS is the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, an RTG. I know that's a lot of acronyms, but yeah. um, you've got a decoder ring, so yeah. I hope uh, you're good there. Um, a space nuclear, but it's an, a space nuclear power system that converts heat into electricity without any moving parts. Um, RPS is work by converting heat from the natural decay of radioisotope materials into electricity, and that's what we have um, up on the on the uh, rover that yeah. just, just got launched this morning. Yeah. It consists of two major elements: um, a heat source that contains a radioisotope fuel, uh, mostly plutonium 238, mm -hmm. uh, and solid-state thermocouples that convert the plutonium's decay heat energy to electricity. DOE developed uh, several generations of nuclear space power systems that can be used to supply electricity and use the excess heat for a variety of other space applications. Um, this one that was launched is called the Multi-Mission RTG, and it was designed with the flexibility to be able to be operated um, on planetary bodies with atmospheres just like Mars, as well as in the vacuum of space. It's amazing yeah. the longevity of that battery. Yeah, I yes. heard it could last up to up to 14 years. Right. Uh, will it actually last longer than that duration? It can, and actually right now it was 17 years, three years here, wow. uh, for, and then 14 years um, out in, in the mission itself. So we're very excited about that. Um, that's one of the benefits of powering this mission with nuclear energy. Um, the RPSs that are currently powering Voyager 1 and 2 um, that are exp exploring the extremes of our solar system um, also are being powered by an RPS that has uh, lasted for 43 years. Wow. And wow. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. A, so that's a long time. That's, that's a great, great ex extent of time. Yeah. Um, the well, MMRTG is essentially, it's a nuclear battery, like yeah. you said, um, and it contains only 10.6 pounds of plutonium dioxide fuel, um, and it pr provides 2,000 watts of thermal power. Um, it's similar, the material that's used in this is similar to what was used in the two Viking spacecraft that landed on Mars in 1976. Wow. So this technology has been around a long time yes. and it's well proven. Yes. Dr. Rita Barinwal, we thank you very much. The secretary, or assistant secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy, thanks for coming out. We're thank so glad you. you enjoyed the launch too. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, here's a statistic you might not know about. Missions to Mars, roughly half of them actually make it there. Imagine that. But right now, we know the health of the Mars 2020 rocket is good because it's sending back a stream of data to our telemetry nerve center here at the Cape. Let's go back now to Joshua Santora to learn more about that. Joshua? Yeah, thanks, Daryl. So we talked to Dr. Denton Gibson, who is one of the guys that works behind the scenes, but there is a group of folks that work behind the people behind the scenes, uh, and Jessica Connor is one of those. She's coming to us now from the same Hangar, a loca Hangar AE location. Jessica, thanks for joining us. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, uh, so tell us about what you do uh, to help make all of these activities, and as Daryl mentioned, the telemetry happen. What do you do for, uh, what's your role for LSP? So I work as a mission communications engineer for LSP. That means that I'm getting the video, data, and voice requirements from the spacecraft and then ensuring that they're able to go ahead and, and uh, perform these operations once they actually get to uh, pad phase. Yeah, Joshua, I was just going to say Jessica's one of our wizards. You said behind the scene within the launch services program as engineers, we depend on our folks at AE to make sure that we get everything we need to do our assessments as engineers. So they make everything possible there. Yeah, absolutely. So Jessica, tell us a little bit about uh, how you get the data back and then how it's utilized out to the team. So while it's on the pad, we go ahead and get that data through the umbilical lines and then that go ahead that goes ahead and uh, gets back to the engineers and they're able to provide fleet insight based on uh, the, the data that they get from the consoles. And can you tell us about how long you've been working this mission? People probably don't understand how much time goes in ahead of time behind the scenes to make these missions happen. So I've been working for about two and a half years on this mission. About two years out, we start working with JPL to go ahead and get those requirements. And then we've been working with them since to go ahead and get a processing video and also um, being able to talk back to JPL, being able to talk um, to headquarters and stuff like that. Awesome. And so what's been the biggest challenge for this mission? I know that this mission's presented a lot of unique challenges for all of our teams, but for you, uh, where has that challenge lied? 
So we have a ton of experience from different mission comm engineers from the past. And so the most unique thing about this mission has been our treatment of COVID. And it's amazing what we've done to go ahead and keep the control room safe for all of the people on console and to go ahead and launch this mission on time and successfully. Hey, listen, and we did it. Uh, we have the data coming back. Yeah. So that means that, you, yeah, I think that means you did your job really well today. I, yeah, I, I, I would so. say they, they did their job great, Joshua. They, uh, they, they found new ways, as we talked earlier with the launch team, uh, finding new ways to their stuff. The folks out at Hangar AE also found new ways to make sure that all the engineering team could perform their fleet's insight uh, assessments and support today's launch. So that, that team out there has done a great job. They actually make us in engineering look good. So we appreciate all the work you guys do, Jessica. Yeah, awesome. Jessica, congratulations. Uh, job well done. Thank you for joining us for this interview today. Thanks. All right, so Mick, uh, things are pretty quiet now, um, and that's expected because um, we're just hanging out for the signal acquisition. Uh, the time there is is the estimate based on the pre-launch data. data yes. uh, right now, we're actually in the shade of the the Earth, uh, so we're behind the Earth, and so we'll come out of that at some point shortly, and then hopefully acquire that signal because there's some solar rays that have to play in here. Um, so still, still, kind of some. I don't know. The tense is the right right word, but it's it's we're anxious still. Yeah, I, I would say we're anxious. We're focused still. As I like to I like to refer back to what Tori said earlier, right? Focused and disciplined. Even though it's pretty quiet right now, we have had spacecraft separation, which was a huge milestone for the team, an exciting time for us at NASA, ULA, JPL, the DOE, and our United States States Space Force uh, family. But the team is still sitting on console. They're yeah. still following their procedures. They're still performing everything that needs to be done as we await the acquisition signal. Uh, some of the things that are going on here behind us is ground securing and everything here at the complex to make sure we can safely enter and do the work. So yeah, very a lot good. of work still going on. Yes, and we're going to send you back to Daryl because we need to check in and uh, talk to the folks who are going to be getting that data back. So uh, Daryl will check in for a one, la one last thing uh, in just a few minutes. All right, thank you very much. You can imagine driving out into the countryside and uh, you farthest from the nearest cell phone tower, and you look down at your cell phone, you see one bar, a very faint signal. And as you mentioned, uh, Mars is very far away, so you get a very faint uh, signal, very much less than one bar. And so thankfully, we have on the ground uh, from our deep space network, managed out of JPL, very large antenna dishes uh, that can detect that very faint signal. You're talking about a signal that's basically like an incandescent light bulb and receiving that from millions of miles. We have 70 meter antennas, and 34 meter antennas. A 70 meter antenna is about the size, to give some context, about the size of a 20 story building. So very large uh, systems that can detect that very faint signal. Great, and the Deep Space Network also communicates with all of our other missions beyond the moon. Now, how far have we gone into space? Well, our Voyager missions are the farthest and fastest uh, human made objects uh, that exist. Uh, Voyager 1 is nearly 14 billion miles away from Earth. It takes almost 20 hours one way to communicate to it. So once again, you can think about that light bulb. Could you imagine turning on a light bulb or a light switch and that light taking 20 hours to get to your eyes? And so basically to communicate to Voyager, we, we send a command saying hi, it takes 20 hours to get there, and every 20 hours to receive a response um, from Voyager. So very far away. Thankfully, Mars uh, is not as far as what, far away as you mentioned, several million miles, not billions. Uh, so it takes not 20 hours, but it takes about seven minutes. So it's a little better uh, situation there. Wow. So what does it take to add the Perseverance mission to the Deep Space Network? Well, it's a lot of pre-work uh, before the launch. Uh, we test with the launch vehicle. We test with the spacecraft. We test with the rover. Uh, we, we, we test over and over again to ensure that when it launches, when the spacecraft separates, when it lands on Mars, that we can have confidence that it will be able to establish a communication with us back on Earth. That's very important, and we instill that confidence by testing and making sure we have a lot of testing up front. And the payoff comes when we see those great, awe-inspiring images from Mars. And so a lot of testing happens out front, uh, up front, and a great team that works on that. Great. Now, getting an acquisition of signal is a very significant moment. Can you tell us how it works and what we should expect to see for this mission? Yes, that's a very important uh, important moment. And sometimes you'll see a, a, a spectrum graph that's a couple of squiggly lines in the bottom, and what you expect to see is a is a is a peak in the middle come up, and that's what you call the carrier signal. 
And a carrier signal uh, is described as a carrier because what it does, it brings in, it, it brings in the, the signal. It carries the signal to us. Therefore, we can see that signal and know that we're receiving data. And basically, we see the, the carrier signal. But after that, we have to decode what the signal is saying. And hopefully, what we're seeing is that the spacecraft is saying, hey, I'm doing OK. I'm on my way to Mars. And uh, I'll see you there in seven months. And so we expect to see that signal. And then we'll decode it and be able to get the health and safety of the spacecraft. But also, what we'll also look out for is uh, how to track it. So once we have the signal, we'll lock onto it. We'll move our very large antenna dishes. And as the Earth spins, we'll track the spacecraft uh, around the globe. This is a global effort. We have uh, our station in Canberra, uh, Australia, and Madrid, Spain, and Goldstone, California, who will all be part of this tracking as the spacecraft uh, goes to Mars. So very exciting time, and we're looking forward to hearing from Perseverance shortly. Great. Thank you, Philip. Now, we are just a couple minutes away from the first opportunity we will have to see if the Perseverance signal on the Deep Space Network is up on our screens. That moment brings us one step closer to Mars, but we have many other milestones to hit over the next seven months, and I'm with Perseverance's chief engineer, Adam Steltzner, who will tell us what's in store for the rover. Adam, what should we expect to see next? Oh. Well, Raquel, um, we are, after we acquire signal, uh, we, we have left the building. We are on our way to Mars. We're no longer in orbit around Earth. Um, and uh, what, what will happen next is we will start our cruise phase. Um, uh, it'll be about seven months before we make it to the red planet. We have a set of um, uh, planned trajectory change maneuvers that we do during cruise to adjust our targeting. In fact, we're targeting to miss Mars right now. We're on the way general direction of Mars. But in order to make our Atlas Centaur, which threw us in the direction of Mars, not run into Mars, we're, we're on a, um, a missing trajectory. And we'll do TCM-1, which will target our um, our impact with the with the Martian surface uh, in a few days. So uh, we um, start to monitor the spacecraft, make sure it's healthy and happy, and uh, tweak its trajectory to be right on target by the time we make it to Mars. Great, thank you so much, Adam. And right now we are just a minute away from the acquisition of signal. So let's pause for a moment and watch our teams at work. Um, 
Sony Mem Redefined Report Initial Acquisition. There we go. That's it. How we do Radio Science? Flight Nav. Go ahead, Nav. Uh, we're seeing one way down. Uh, three, four, three, say your S. Uh, didn't copy Nav. Yes, sir. We see AOS at uh, 131531. It's copies. Thank you. We now have an acquisition of signals. The rumbles now are of claps and cheers, and it's an amazing moment. And the years of blood, sweat, and tears from every person who worked on this mission is now realized as Perseverance makes its way to Mars. Now, if we still have Adam here, Adam, I want to know your reaction to getting the acquisition of Signal. Well, uh, Raquel, it's very nice to have the spacecraft in a uh, safe, um, separated on its way to Mars. Nav looks good. We are hearing from the spacecraft. That was the only question. Uh, and it's not really much of a question, but it's just nice to have that confirmation. Um, our launch process is complete. Uh, the vehicle's on its way to Mars. Um, and so the next chapter in uh, Perseverance's mission can begin. Great. And what are you looking forward to next? Uh, I'm looking forward to, ideally, a very quiet and boring cruise to Mars as we prepare for the never boring and always dis um, stressful entry, descent, landing on the 18th of February. Great. Thank you so much, Adam. And we hope you tune into our coverage of the landing happening on February 18th, 2021. Joshua and Mick, we here at JPL would like to thank you and the entire launch service program and United Launch Alliance teams for all your amazing work today and all the work you do every day to make a launch like this possible. Now, Joshua, back to you at the Cape. Raquel, uh, congratulations to you and the team over there. Obviously, JPL, uh, I think Adam's response is kind of what you'd expect from Adam of like, hey, check that box, but we got a lot of work to go. Yes, yeah. I mean, the work here for the launch team, exciting day. Yes. We got this done. Our portion of this is done. Adam and the team now have March 2020 underway, and they've got a lot of work in front of them, too. And hopefully it is a quiet seven months, and they get ready to go. But we are so excited to be able to perform this uh, for them as our JPL customer. I know Tori Bruno and the ULA team are excited as as well and uh, I just can't be I, I, I'm just yeah, I can't be more excited about how this it, went it this feels morning. good yes. hey before we sign off today we want to check in with the NASA launch manager Omar Baez to get some thoughts from him Omar kind of give us your response after seeing a successful process this morning okay so um, about a minute ago um, we did get acquisition of the spacecraft signal uh, that signifies that uh, um, JPL's uh, Deep Space Network has uh, locked on to the spacecraft. It's on its uh, journey to Mars. Uh, everything appears to be going nominally for them. They'll get to check out the spacecraft now, do those checks that they need to do to learn how to fly that, that vehicle the way it wants to fly on its way to Mars. Uh, pretty interesting. Uh, we separated them at approximately 25,000 miles an hour, and uh, it's going to take uh, a little bit of a couple of months to get to that February 18th landing date, which they're targeting. So it's an impressive amount of uh, speed that uh, we imparted to them, and, and that speed is what uh, our job as Launch Services Program and United Launch Alliance is to provide that spacecraft. The uh, heavy lifting now is on our partners at the Jet Propulsion Lab um, to slow it down when it gets to Mars, um, up the uh, parachutes, slow them down in the atmosphere, and uh, extend that uh, sky crane and, and land on Mars. So they've got a heck of a lot of work to do uh, from here on out. Um, today's count went uh, beautiful up until the last 20 minutes. Uh, 
started to get exciting with some of the assets on the range uh, having dropouts. And uh, then a surprise call from um, uh, the uh, spacecraft mission director that uh, we had uh, a small earthquake uh, in California at uh, Pasadena um, that the folks in the control room felt. Uh, but they uh, never lost signal, um, and they uh, came back to me and, and uh, said they were ready to proceed. We were able to, to lock down the, the time we were after. Launched on time, perfect launch from what I could see visually here in the control room. Um, the orbital parameters look uh, dead on. Our velocity is dead on. So we're on our way to Mars. There's no way back. So. Uh, good luck to the uh, Mars 2020 team. It's been a pleasure to be part of this. I've been with this uh, uh, roving Mars community um, since Sojourner um, and through spirit, opportunity, and uh, curiosity. So it's a pleasure to be once again um, part of that little bit um, that, that becomes that club, that auto club, of roving on Mars, and uh, I just want to say I'm very proud of this team. This team has uh, worked diligently to get here. Um, it, it, it's hard enough to get to Mars, throw in COVID. Um, today we're dealing with uh, a small earthquake, the threat of a, a tropical storm heading in our direction. It's just a, an immense amount of pressure on the team, and it's so relieving to be able to have gotten that mission off today on the first attempt. And with that, um, that closes the show for us. Awesome. A big thanks to Omar. Uh, appreciate him and his words. Obviously, a, a phenomenal effort from all five of our teams we talked about. Yes. Um, so uh, from LSP, congrats to this team, JPL. Uh, congrats to the U.S. Space Force. Congrats to ULA. Thank you to ULA for hosting us today. And then the Department of Energy. Um, and a special thanks to a couple groups, the yep. RADCC yep. and the JIC. Uh, those were two teams that were working behind the scenes for over three years to prepare for a contingency with the, the, the RTG. MMRTG. That's correct. Um, didn't have to exercise any of that work, which is what they wanted. Like, yep. that's so kind of one of the things. They had a great day. They had a great day. Yes, everybody had a great day. So, uh, Mick, thanks to you as well for joining me. Appreciate it, Joshua. Thanks for having me again. I've always loved doing this with you. And, again, excited about the Mars mission. As Omar said, uh, our, our prayers and, and good luck with the JPL <laughs> team. They've got a lot of work in front of them. And we're just so excited to get them on their way in a, in a perfect uh, launch in orbit today. So thanks again for having me. Yeah, the countdown to Mars continues. That's going to do it for us at the ASOC for the launch of the Mars 2020 mission with the Perseverance rover. Daryl, back to you. All right, Mick Woltman and Joshua Santora, thank you both. A great job done by you. And again, congratulations to the Launch Services Program team here at NASA for the great launch as well as United Launch Alliance getting that off. And I, I got to congratulate you as well, Dr. Yeah. Moo. You're with JPL. You've been working on this for seven years. Yes. Congratulations. How does yeah. it feel? It's amazing to have this phase of the mission cemented now in time oh. is amazing. But like Adam said, there's so much more to go. A lot of work to do, but you know that your baby right there in front of you is on its way yes, to Mars. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, engineers and scientists at NASA have spent years designing, as we told you, and testing and building the Mars Perseverance rover, but we've also had help from a number of countries around the world. Norway, France, and Spain, just to name a few, but also the European and Japanese space agencies. Here now is a toast to all of those who helped us get to Mars and help that Perseverance rover get ready to fly. Congratulations for the successful launch of this fantastic new mission to the planet Mars. Congratulations for the great work, despite all the obstacles set by COVID-19. I want to congratulate everybody who made this mission happen thus far. Thank you all for the passion and the commitment to make this epic happen. Bravo et toutes mes félicitations, uh, which means uh, my heartfelt congratulations to all the teams involved in this uh, magnificent uh, adventure. So you've been rewarded with a beautiful launch, and I hope you'll have a safe cruise to Mars. So well done, the work so far. Let's keep going. School to all teams for a successful flight. 
Our international effort to reach Mars is, is more important now than it ever has been before. This mission confirms that uh, when we work together, we can overcome unbelievable challenges. And to build a mission that truly deserves its name, Perseverance. To persevere means to insist, to keep on, to continue trying tirelessly. And if we persevere, we succeed. And that's why I think this is an appropriate name for this mission. Perseverance has just started the journey to make history in Mars exploration. It's the start of our collaboration. Not only to go to Mars, but to bring back samples, the Mars Sample Return Campaign, and this is going to change our view of Mars forever. Mars is an amazing place to explore. Because exploration is inside the, the human being, very nature. Mars is essential to understand and know about our solar system, including our Earth. We believe we can contribute to scientific discovery and the future human exploration of Mars. This exploration of Mars is of great global significance as it contributes to the humanity's search for a home away from planet Earth. We need robotic precursor missions like Mars 2020 Perseverance to help us understand where we need to go and what we need to do when we get to Mars but ultimately our objective as a globe is to put humans on the surface of Mars. Together we're counting down to Mars, so go Perseverance! It's the only thing we can do together. Let's go Perseverance! We're doing it together against the race for Mars. Bye Perseverance! Together we're returning to Mars. Good voyage Perseverance! Hot Perseverance! Adelante Perseverance! Hiya Perseverance! Together we are counting down to Mars. Go Perseverance! And thank you so much to our international partners that you just saw there. They did a fantastic job. Now, before we let you go, we want to tell you about a little tradition that JPL has yeah. where they did this, I guess, after the launch or before the launch with with some peanuts and Moo knows it well. Yeah, in fact, Perseverance, a little baby Percy brought us some peanuts here <laughs> to divvy out. So let me give you some. Look yeah, at there. It actually started with oh. a landing oh. event. Uh, so Rangers one through six didn't go as planned. And okay. then with Ranger 7, it landed successfully on the moon. And they were thinking, what was the difference between Rangers 1 through 6 and 7? Uh -huh. And it was these lucky peanuts. The lucky peanuts. Yeah. And so ever since then, I guess they've been having peanuts. Exactly. To, to get the every landing and now launches. Well, and now we've got ours in our hand. We're yeah. going to hold off because we got a little more reading to do. <laughs> but we're ready to go with our peanuts. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for watching NASA's launch coverage of Mars 2020. Stay tuned to NASA TV and our social media channels for updates to the mission. Yeah, coming up in just a bit at 1130 Eastern Daylight Time, we will have a post-launch news conference right here on NASA TV, so stay tuned for that. And of course, to the next big moment that we've been talking about, the landing of the Perseverance rover on the surface of Mars seven months from now. That date, February 18th, 2021. So for now, we leave you with highlights from the thrilling liftoff earlier this morning. Take care, everyone, and remember, keep looking up. Cheers. Cheers. Lou. <laughs> Seven, six, five, five, four. Engine ignition, two, one, zero. Zero. Release. And liftoff. As the countdown to Mars continues, the perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the red planet. And Atlas TU has gone to closed loop control. Coming up on third.